Blog Talk Radio. My ancestors woke me up this morning. They said, son, you do know what time it is, don't you? I said, what time is that? They said, it's war time, so welcome to the war front. Brothers and sisters, War on the Horizon is broadcasting 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, all year round. And now we're broadcasting live. Listen to our live lineup every Sunday night from 5 p.m. to 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. You'll be traveling in the southbound lane with our brother Louis Ali, trying to get our people free. Directly following that show from 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. on Sunday night, it'll be the Children of Southampton show featuring the Queen Sister Nefertari of Children of Southampton. Monday nights from 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, it's the War on the Horizon show featuring yours truly, the irritated genie of Southeast. Tuesday nights, 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, the context of white supremacy featuring Gus T. Renegade and our little sister Justice. Wednesday nights, 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, it's the King Samir Show. Every Thursday night from 7 p.m. to 9 p.m., tune in for the Drop Squad featuring our sister Fasami. And on Saturdays, we have a very special treat for you. From 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, we have the Round Table. The last Saturday of every month, all of your favorite guests get together and discuss the pertinent issues confronting black people worldwide. That's a show you don't want to miss. All you have to do is go to WarOnTheHorizon.com and click our Listen Live, Live 365 button. Or you can go to Live365.com and look up War on the Horizon. Remember, brothers and sisters, at War on the Horizon Radio, we came here to save you, not to be your friend. We look forward to seeing you on the battlefield. War on the Horizon. You gotta love it. Your Rose Homos and Negroes, War on the Horizon Radio, and I'll be for you. On my end, when I'm speaking, but that may just be the way I'm picking stuff up, but if you can hear it, fine to go. Oh, uh, you are break- I can understand you, but I can. you're breaking up a little bit. Uh, I can't hear you, but there's a little bit of uh, distortion. Uh, okay. Um, let me uh, try to make sure that I get it at the best connection possible. Uh, okay. Is that any better? Uh, just talk. Give me like 30 seconds. Just talk for 30 seconds and let me see. Right. Well, um, when my ancestors woke me up this morning, they said, son, you know what time it is, don't you? I said, what time is that? They said, it's war time. Send to the war front. Radio Free Dixie, first, first program, Be Renegade, the Irritated Genius Southeast. The second Friday of every month, you're going to. Uh, I'm not. How am I coming? You're still breaking up. Um, let's see, I can. You want me to try doing it via cell phone or. Yeah, that's probably going to. Um, <clears throat> that's probably what we're going to have to uh, uh, do for some strange reason. I'm having this problem with the uh, uh, constantly scanning, and so since it's complicated. Uh, so um, let me try one more thing. I'm calling on the cell phone so we can get a real, real uh, clear connection because I think it's going to be a really good show. Okay, we, I can even give you. I can give you a commercial if you want to take a take a moment to reload your uh, your Skype or anything, and uh, that'll give you a couple minutes, and then we can try it again. You want to do that? Uh, yeah, we. Okay, I'll give you a commercial real quick, so you should have like two minutes or so to uh, get things together. Uh, give us a second. Be patient. Contact. Oh, excuse me. This is Radio Free Dixie, and uh, we will take a quick commercial. Give Irritated Genie a chance to uh, get his. Yeah. Type. Uh, like, give me like 10 seconds or so. Just talk for 10 seconds or so. Uh, lost you on the line completely. We're going to take a quick commercial break and get it together. Sorry about that, game. Radio Free Dixie. We are uh, trying to get the audio is straightened out. I'm going to dial uh, Irritated Genie back and uh, see if his line is a little clearer. Um, okay. Dialing Irritated Genie. 
back again, see if he has his line clear. Our apologies uh, for the tech issues. Could be interference from white people. Never know. Um, hopefully it will all be cleaned up now. So I'm dialing Irritated Gene now. Just got to, okay, got him online. Hmm. Uh, okay, okay. See, okay, he's not showing up on my Skype. Now I'm going to dial him on the phone and see if that works. Oh, okay, he's back now. <laughs> he's back now. Okay, they're making me work a little bit on the board today. Um, okay. Let's see. And last one. Okay. All right. Should have him back. Let's see if his connection is clear. Yes, sir. How are you doing, brother? I'm well, sir. Okay, just talk again for like 60 seconds. Let me see how you sound. All right, brothers and sisters. This is the Irritated Genius Southeast with Gus T. Renegade on our Radio Free Dixie program starting for the first time today, November 12, 2010, where we're going to have the, the debate to determine whether or not black nationalism is the idea and the formula for black independence, freedom, and the destruction of the system of racial and white supremacy, or if it is a monumental waste of black time. So are you ready to go, Brother Gus? Do we sound good? Uh, you sound crystal clear, uh, crystal clear. I think we should be good to go. Um, I, yeah, I guess, folks, if you're listening in, you can you can let us know if you have any problems, but we should be good to go. Uh, somebody is listening in. Okay, yeah, we should be good to go. Outstanding. Um, anything you would like to start off? This is our first program. You want to let folks know about the broadcast or what we're going to talk about today? Uh, yeah, basically, uh, the way we decided to have this discussion is that we, we had a show, a program, I think it was a Gus program, and, or one of my programs, I don't remember how it started, but both of us were on the program together, and people were saying that they liked the energy that we had on our programs together. They were actually, people were saying they really liked uh, Brother King Samir and Sister Fasami together, and they were saying that they liked um, Sister Nefertari and, and Brother Louis Ali together. And they say that they like, you know, when Brother Gus and I go together, and particularly, uh, and just so people know, <clears throat> the third Friday of every month, starting next Friday, from 7 to 9, is going to be Sister Nefertari and Brother Louis Ali. They're going to have a show, and they're going to do that once a month on the third Friday of every month. So on the first Friday of every month, we're going to have Brother Malimu Baruti and his wife, Ya Baruti. Uh, the second Friday of every month, we're going to have, and that's how the show is called, Abibi Fahodier, African Liberation. And then the second Friday of every month, we're going to have Gus T. Renegade and the Irritated Genius Southeast, Radio Free Dixie. And the third weekend of every month, uh, every Friday, third Friday of every month, we're going to have Sister Nefertari and Brother Louis Ali. So that's going to be an outstanding program as well that you all can look forward to listening to. And uh, Gus and I did a show recently, and we had some disagreement, and I thought it was very constructive. And people commented consistently how they liked the fact, you know, we weren't just uh, cop mimicking what each other saying that you know we had disagreement but we were able to do it without it being absolutely disagreeable. So I you know we, we talked about it and we decided you know what let's have some discussion where we're not just sitting here all in agreement but where we have some disagreement to see if we can come to some conclusions that can uh, help us move forward. And uh, with that said, we decided to have our first show the second Friday of every month starting in November, and we're going to have what will be considered a debate, a discussion, a challenge, what have you, as to the credence and the value of black nationalism. And, of course, as someone who considers myself a black nationalist, as an African nationalist, uh, I'm going to take the position that it is not only an answer, but it's the answer to the problem. And Gus C. Renegade, if I'm understanding correctly, is going to take the position to challenge whether or not that is actually what – is going to solve the problem of racism, white supremacy, or if we're spending our energy in the wrong way with black nationalism. I think that has I want to make sure I give out the numbers uh, for folks if they want to uh, call in, if you just want to listen on your phone, 
uh, or if you want to ask questions, uh, you can call uh, 760-569-7676, and the code that you need is 948-656. So let me give the number one more time, 760-569-7676, and the code that you're going to need is 948 656. Uh, I suspect you might be able to dial uh, at Blog Talk Radio as well. It doesn't really matter, but just if you want another number, uh, it's 347 215 6071. That number again, 347 215 6071. It doesn't matter to me if the Blog Talk line fills up, dial the first number. Um, you know, doesn't matter. Um, would you like to, I guess, uh, give a, a brief outline, like two, three minute outline of, of your position on black nationalism? Yeah, I think that's a good way to start. <clears throat> uh, essentially, black nationalism, and, and we'll get into definitions of what we're talking about and so forth and what have you, but my, my position is that black nationalism throughout the history of the world has been the most successful concept or philosophy that black people have existed under and progressed under and fought the system of racism and white supremacy under. My, my, my position is that any failure for our people to completely eradicate the system of racism and white supremacy, and that, that means whites themselves, is not a failure in black nationalism. It is a failure in black people to universally accept the concept and the practical application of black nationalism as a unified tool to destroy racial and white supremacy. In other words, it has not been the philosophy and the practice. It has been our failure to use it to its maximum extent to resolve the problem that has been the issue and I would say that any successful, uh, even for a period of time, any successful wars that have been waged or, or efforts that have been waged on behalf of black people against white supremacy and injustice in general have come in some way, shape, or, or guise under the umbrella of black nationalist thinking, philosophy, and, and action. Uh, I want to double check because I believe Justice might be with us as well. I want to make sure if she is here. Justice, uh, are you are you with us? Yes. Your line is open. Are you there? Hello. Yes, ma'am. Are you with us? Yes. Outstanding. Um, I guess since we're having a discussion, what you can do uh, if you have questions. Uh, for anybody, any of the terms that they're using, or if you don't understand something that's said, uh, just, you know, hop right in. Um, if you have a position on black nationalism, that would be great. We can hear your, uh, we can hear your position as well. Um, I guess, did you, did you hear what, uh, irritated Jeannie? Did you hear his opening remarks about, uh, what he believes to be true about black nationalism? Um, I did not because I didn't because I called in a little bit late. Okay. Um, I don't want to summarize. Do you want to give her a quick quick summary of what you said just so she'll be up to speed? Yes, that's no problem. Essentially, black nationalism has been the most effective tool that black people have used in fighting white supremacy throughout the history of the world. I'm not talking about just in America that black nationalist philosophy has been the primary tool and the most successful tool at fighting white aggression in, in, in the history of the world. Okay. Um, do you have any questions uh, for Irritated Jeannie about what he just said, or are you, are you clear about what he just said? Uh, I'm clear what he just said. Ruby, okay. Um, I guess if I was to give my quick or two-minute summary of my thoughts on 
uh, black nationalism. I would want to point out the description over at war on the horizon dot com uh, says monumental waste of time. I didn't say monumental waste of time. I just said waste of time with a question mark. So wanted to uh, point that out. But my two minute uh, summary of black nationalism would be that, uh, in my view, uh, it is insanity to continue to do the same thing uh, while expecting a different result. Uh, white people have proven themselves to be more than capable of annihilating all efforts at establishing so-called black nationalism thus far. It has been my observation that white people refine their ability to practice and maintain the system of white supremacy. As such, uh, I suspect that white people in 2010 would be much better equipped to obliterate any further attempts at resurrecting an idea that has a 100-year track record of failure. And when I say failure, I mean a failure to eradicate the system of white supremacy. Uh, I will say I believe that what Irritated Genie is going to share, I could be incorrect, but I believe that his stance is going to be more palatable to black people. It will sound better. It will make us feel good uh, than what I'm saying. What I'm saying does not make us feel very good. It's going to sound terrible. It's going to paint a very uh, depressing picture of black folks and the system of white supremacy, but I believe that what we need more than anything is truth accurate information about what is happening, not, you know, just saying things for the sake of making folks feel good. I could be incorrect, um, but that is my position. And I would also say that anything that makes white people really happy, I get suspicious. Uh, I believe that is a quote from uh, Malcolm X. I would also say that anything that makes black people happy, I get very suspicious. And the reason is we have been thoroughly programmed, groomed, and confused under the system of white supremacy. And sadly, my observation has been many of the things that black people have an affinity for, gravitate to, things that we tend to like, most of those things tend to support the system of racism, white supremacy, directly and or indirectly. Um, I want to make sure during the program, if you are listening, if you call in, if you have questions and you want to share your view, uh, Irritated Genie and uh, Justice, since they're uh, with us on the broadcast, point out if I'm saying anything that is incorrect, real key. I want to make sure I'm, I'm not saying things that are false. Uh, if I'm saying anything incorrect, please point that out. If what I'm saying is correct, then I would hope that anyone, any black person listening to the broadcast, I uh, will seriously question the concept of black nationalism and uh, even consider burying the idea of establishing so-called black nationalism. Uh, that would be my uh, statement of my position. Um, Justice, do you have any questions? Did you understand what I said? Um, I do not have any questions. Thank you. Ruby. Okie doke. Um, I guess you. How would you like to uh, kick off, uh, Gene? Do you want to? Do you want to give your definition for black nationalism, or how would you like to go? Yeah, you know what? I'm gonna give a few definitions. It's gonna take a minute or so, but we got time tonight. And since you know, this is my good brother Gus T. Renegade here, and I have to, uh, quite frankly, I have to obliterate his position tonight. And his position is one that I'm not going to say does not have a rational basis. But I have to have everybody leave, not, not feeling good, but confident that the correct answer is if we're going to defeat the system of racism and white supremacy and the white race and end their rule on this planet and their existence, then we need a philosophy that has proven to work, but that we need to take it and make it to be effective enough to get this particular task that we want to have achieved, achieved, 
and that there is no better philosophy to do it than black nationalism. And so in order to do that, <clears throat> I want to make sure that I'm very clear on the things we're saying. Uh, first, if we're saying black nationalism, if we're talking about black, I want to make a differentiation. I want to give two definitions so people know what we're talking about when we say black, when we say African, and what is black nationalism. So when we say black, a black person, we're talking about an individual who has a blood, who is a blood descendant of any number of different ancient African bloodlines who is identical by eyesight as a descendant of Africa, whose blood mother and father are identified by eyesight as being descendants of the black race. Now, whites, meaning Europeans, yellow people, meaning Chinese, uh, you know, Koreans or other Asians, uh, Arabs, and even the red man and woman, non-white Hispanics, are not black. However, the red man and woman and their descendants, who we many call, times call Hispanics now, are historical friends to the black race. So I'm hoping that people understand what we're saying when we're saying black. But they have to have a black mother and a black father, descendants of Africa. We're not talking about Europeans, Asians, or Native Americans. However, Native Americans slash Hispanics have been historical friends to our race. Um, when we talk about black nationalism as a philosophy, what we are talking about, one, we're talking about uh, uh, consciousness, and so I have to talk about what consciousness is very quickly. Consciousness means that a black person is aware that racism and white supremacy exists. They have substantial knowledge above and beyond the masses of black people about the history and the circumstances surrounding the ongoing conflict between the black race and the white race. So the first construct, the first piece of uh, being a black nationalist, or one of the pieces, is being conscious. So let me tell people what a black nationalist is or what black nationalism is. Black nationalism is the application of black consciousness in one's life. In other words, the recognition that racism and white supremacy exists, the application of that, that's black nationalism. It refers to the degree in which a conscious African dedicates their life to building a philosophy, community, nation, and or world under black dominion, meaning black people should rule the world, and the degree to which their life is dedicated to ending white rule. An African nationalist must be an active, loyal member of the black race. Uh, and, 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 and so black nationalism, essentially, if you want to have a, as a formula, is your decency, meaning your behavior and your character. Are you a decent person, honest, hardworking? Do you have good characteristics in general? Are you conscious of the fact that racism and white supremacy exists? And are you working in the best way that you know how to end and destroy white rule, white authority, white life on planet Earth, white dominion? That is black nationalism. And, and a black nationalist is a person who does basically four things. One, they actively work for the dominion of black people worldwide. In other words, they're working to put black people in a position where we can make the call and control what happens on this planet. Two, they actively work to destroy white power, white dominion, white supremacy, which ultimately means black, white existence on this planet. That's, what they, that's their main focus, to get rid of this system, to put our people in control. Thirdly, actively strive to be a decent African who consistently participates in progressive behavior and actively fights against unprogressive European vices and misbehavior within themselves and exhibited in other Africans. So if you see people participate in homosexuality, in thievery of other black people, of talking down to other black people unjustly, of murdering black people unjustly, or just poor character traits and behavior, you're trying to better yourself, to cleanse yourself of that. You're trying to help your other brothers and sisters uh, cleanse themselves of that. And if a needs be, you're making somebody stop doing it if they're black, or you're trying to prevent it, and you're trying to implement law to prevent it from happening. And lastly, recognizes that whites are the bitter, impractical, unalterable enemies of the black race and lives accordingly. So you cannot have anyone that does not, you can't be a black nationalist and then say it's not all whites. When you are a black nationalist, you recognize that every white two-legged being on this planet that can think is an enemy of your race and must be destroyed. And you live with an understanding that that is what needs to happen in order for us to achieve the goals of black nationalism.
And lastly, I'd like to say one last thing just to have some clarification. We gave a definition for what it means to be black. And so now when we say an African, the only difference between a black person and when we say African, when we say a person is an African, it means that is a person who identifies themselves as a black person, meets all the criteria of being a black person, has a sense of black racial pride, and wants to bring a permanent end to white racial rule. So in other words, you can have a black person that doesn't have any consciousness. We would call them a Negro. They're black, but they have no consciousness, so we wouldn't call them an African because they don't recognize themselves as black and, and love themselves. So every African is a black person, but not every black person is an African because some of our people don't have a consciousness to know that being black means that they're an African, and so hence they're not an African. They don't even acknowledge or recognize themselves as such. So those are our definitions, and we can start getting into this discussion. Um, Justice, did you did you have anything any questions uh, based on what uh, Jeannie just shared? Um, no, I don't. But uh, if I do have any questions, then I'll just uh, jump right in. Oh, outstanding! I love it. I love it. Okay. Um, I have a, a question, and then um, well, let me ask my question first, and then I'll see. I might I might have another question, or I might have statements that I'll make. Um, when we conducted the roundtable, yeah, um, the last Saturday of November, uh, excuse me, last Saturday in October, um, and which we'll be doing every last Saturday of the month uh, with all of the radio hosts at War on the Horizon, uh, we discussed uh, black nationalism and definitions about what it means to be a black person. Uh, on that discussion, Saturday, October 30th, um, did you say that justice gave the best definition for what it means to be a black person under the system of racism, and white supremacy, and her definition was a black person is whomever white people classify as black. Is that true? I said at that time that she gave the most concise answer at that time. Did she give the most accurate answer? She gave the most concise answer that could be agreed upon. Okay, I, I, I'm using the term accurate. So if you don't think she gave the most accurate answer, that's fine. But I would just like a yes or no. Did she give the most accurate answer? for what it means to be a black person under the system of racism, white supremacy, during that discussion? I, I won't say she gave the most accurate answer. I'll say she gave the best answer. Okay. <laughs> best would suggest accurate to me, but okay, no problem, no problem. Um, and, let, and let me explain why I say it was the best answer, but it's not necessarily the most accurate answer. The reality of it is that I'm not going to concede to let whites shape the world with their words. What I'm saying is that I did not at that time, and I don't think anybody on that discussion, had even considered the fact that we all call ourselves black and that we talk about black nationalism and that we talk about being black and working for black, but that we had never actually sat down and came up with a concrete, simple to understand explanation of what being black was. Can you say that one more time for me, please? I'm going to say that we did not we had not, as of that night, mm -hmm. sat down and come up with a concise, clear definition of what we mean when we say black. And I realized that when Sister Justice gave the most, again, I'm not saying it was the most accurate because I don't agree with that being the most accurate, but it was the best answer because out of everybody's answer, it was the only one that she could prove her point and the rest of us could not necessarily agree on because we hadn't thought about it. Okay. So because that happened, as a result of realizing, wow, we got more work to do, I've gone back. So I would say that my definition now is more accurate than the definition she gave at that time. But at that day and time, I have to give her credit. She, she laid it on the – she sent me back to the drawing board. I will agree with that, absolutely. Okay. Um, I, I'm just going to – clarify for folks listening in. If you didn't hear the roundtable discussion, it's in the rotation uh, on the War on the Horizon radio network. You can check it out. Uh, I believe it airs uh, on Saturdays at 7 p.m. Eastern 
Yeah. And, and because that one was three hours, it'll go from six to nine. Oh, okay, six to nine. There you go, six to nine Eastern. Uh, if you're Pacific, that would be three to six Pacific. Um, but Justice's definition that she gave uh, was that it, oh, whoop, Justice is here. Justice, you need to give uh, your definition of a black person. A white person who, uh, well, my definition for black is a white person who says that a black person is a black person. Okay. There you go. There you go. Um, and just so we'll have clarification, Jeannie, can you give your definition for a black person one more time, please? I'll give my definition for a black person. A black person is an individual who is a blood descendant of any number of different ancient African bloodlines, who is identifiable, identifiable by eyesight as a descendant of Africa, and whose blood mother and father are identifiable by eyesight as being descendants of the black race. Whites, meaning European, yellow people, Chinese and other Asians, Arabs, and red people are not black. However, Red men and women and their descendants are historical friends to black people. That's my definition for a black person. Okay. 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 Um, the statements that I would make, uh, number one, uh, to have a discussion where I think, other than uh, myself and justice, I suspect um, the folks there support, or it seems like many of them support the notion, the idea, the concept of black nationalism. Um, I might be incorrect about that. Those folks can, can call in or get at me if that is incorrect, but it seemed like their responses suggested that most of those folks were in support of the concept of nat black nationalism. Uh, myself, uh, I think, well, I just find it extremely flawed and it really goes back to exactly what I was saying at the beginning of why I think this concept needs to be seriously scrutinized and, in my opinion, tossed, because if you have people that are saying this is going to solve the problem of racism, white supremacy, and they have not even clearly defined the base root of the word, black nationalism, can't even really sit down and explain in an accurate, concise manner what it, mean, what it means to be black, that is an extraordinary problem. And I mean, really to clarify the incorrectness of this, I mean, that is monumentally incorrect in my opinion. We're not talking about a brand new concept, black nationalism. This, is, this idea has been around for at least a century. This is the same thing Marcus Garvey uh, was working diligently to produce in response to racism, white supremacy. Um, the fact that this idea has been around for a, roughly a century, and we still don't even have a clear, agreed-upon definition of what it means to be black, to me, further evidences the massive problems with attempting to coalesce around us being black and we will form so-called black nationalism. Even the definition that you gave, uh, I could see a lot of people either not agreeing with that, and I could see even some folks saying, well, okay, as I said on the roundtable, I hear a lot of people, white and non-white, who say and will pull out tons of evidence to say that everyone is a descendant of Africa, white people what? included. All, all the definition the specifically says. Wait a, white. Minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I just okay. clear because I want to get to that other part of the definition as well. Okay. Saying clearly identical, clearly identifiable by eyesight. Even with that, that is going to be very subjective. We have had whole programs where there have been black people on the program who looked at someone and came to different conclusions about whether or not that was a black person. In fact, I have stopped discussions on my program. I don't even have rules on my program. That's one of the rules that I have. I do not have discussions about racial classifications with non-white people because I have concluded that it's one thing 
we are extremely confused about, and it is because I totally agree with the concept of making up your own terms, making up your own definition, but there is one particular thing I do not agree with that on, and that is on racial classification. Part of what white supremacy means is that white people dictate racial classification. Non-white people are easily confused about those classifications because they do not control them. White people make those decisions about racial classifications, and they can make them stick. Whether that's we say Tiger Woods is black, regardless of what anyone else has to say about it, and they can make it stick, or it, we say this person is white, regardless of what he looks like. They have gone into South Africa and snatched people that we would look at and say, oh, that's a non-white person. And they say, no, it's a white person, and they can make it stick. That needs to be acknowledged because I believe it's true, and white people demonstrate that they have the power. Even someone called the round table and said that in South Africa, the government, now they didn't clarify with who the government was, but they said that the government in South Africa reclassified so-called Chinese people as black. He called in and said he hadn't, and I've seen that report. To me, that, that's not incorrect. I'd seen that. So I think that's real critical. Even to say identifiable by eyesight, I know that it's going to cause confusion. I know that's going to be subjective because people are not going to agree. That right there is going to be a major point of conflict, in my opinion, because you are going to have a considerable number of people who are not going to agree about a large chunk of folk about whether or not they are black. Do you, is that accurate? Am I saying anything that's uh, incorrect or illogical? No, I, I agree with that 100%. However, I have to say, there's something, and it's a huge part, and it's a piece that you can't leave out in that discussion. We already have a considerable amount of confusion about who's black and who's not. So it's not like we're changing anything. We will have greater clarity than we have now. In other words, to create a definition that we choose to stick that works in our interest, because it's not going to be perfect and have perfect clarity, is not a reason not to do it. That doesn't make any sense. Like you're saying, we have a great deal of confusion now on stuff that we agree with. It doesn't mean that since we don't agree with stuff, we don't do it. You know, uh, A parent may not agree that a child is picking the appropriate mate for them. That doesn't mean that a child decides, well, then I'm not going to have any mate ever, you know, because my parent doesn't agree. I mean, we're not going to agree on everything, but you still move forward. This is a race war. Whites have an exceptional advantage. It does not mean that in places where they have an advantage, like creating definitions, that because they have an advantage in it, an advantage in making them stick, that we sit back and allow that to deter us from fighting. No, we fight. We say, who do we not want to be black? Well, we don't want mulattoes to classify as black because we don't want anybody to date outside the race. And if we look at it historically, mulattoes as a race or as a group, individuals who have a black parent and a white parent, tend to side in fighting against the interests of black people. As a consequence, we don't want that. So we're not going to give them the classification of black. How does that play out in a practical way? Well, black people will not say there was the first black president. We'll say there was a mulatto president. And when we talk about mulattoes and their history and working against the interests of African people, he fits perfectly in that characterization. Now, I want to correct something that you said earlier as well, because we need to be clear. Black nationalism is not a concept that has been around for 100 years. Black nationalism is what created ancient Kemet. Black nationalism is what expelled the Hyksos invaders out of ancient Kemet. Black nationalism is what compelled Hannibal of Carthage and his father before him, Amilcar Barker, to be uh, definitively against the well-being of the Romans to the degree that he waged war in Rome and came close, unfortunately, he didn't win, but came close to eradicating the Roman Empire before a hard, concrete race of the white supremacy system was, was able to be put in place. Black nationalism is what was created the greatest most successful slave rebellion in the history of the world as it relates to an enslaved population being displaced from their home and being enslaved. Haiti, it was the most, not black, but the most re successful rebellion against an enslaver 
who had kidnapped a group and enslaved them in a foreign land. In the history of the world that we have documented is the Haitian Revolution, which, if you read The Irritated Gene, you will find the reason, the primary reason for its success was this concept and this idea of nationalism, which at its very core separates black people from whites and definitively identifies whites as the enemies to black people and de defines them as having to be destroyed in order for us to move to receive whatever objective we're trying to achieve. That is a philosophy that not only is needed, but throughout the history of the world, when you have seen black people be successful, whether they called it black nationalism or not, the most successful black people in waging war and resisting the system of racism and white supremacy have operated under some intellectual, physical, or institutional form of black nationalism. That's what um, what do you mean uh, by uh, biracial? I didn't use the term. Um, when you were uh, talking before uh, the irritated genie, um, mm -hmm. you uh, like uh, the the word was used, and you said a uh, biracial. Uh, I'm pretty certain I didn't use the term biracial. Um, yeah, I would be willing to put some money down, but I didn't use the term biracial. Um, it might have been said, I think Irritated Genie might have been talking about that when he was saying, uh, using the term mulattoes. Um, yeah, I would I would be willing to put some money. It's recorded, so I guess we can go back and see. We'll, we'll see if Justice might be correct that I might have said it, but I don't think I used the term biracial. Okay. Um, did you use the term biracial? Do you remember, Gene? No, I, I don't use that term. I don't like it. Oh, okay. Yeah, I don't. I don't use that term either. So uh, <laughs> I use mulatto because it has a negative slant to it, and I want people to feel like it is a bad decision to date, marry, and have sexual relations outside of our race. Okay. Okay. Um. I would say, number one, you said you, uh, and this all goes back to definitions for black and coming up with our own definitions. I would, again, assert, even with that, you're not going to have agreement about that. And I'm not saying anything where non-white people, black people, don't agree. Uh, just forget it. I'm saying I believe that there is a, another strategy that would work uh, that would coincide with exactly what you're saying. The problem is whites. I totally agree. White, non-white, isolating the problem as white people. Uh, you said, I believe, that so-called uh, Native Americans and other people who are not white but are also not black, many times we've had good relations. I think we would all get along great if we could get rid of white people. Um, I think classifying as not white, these and, and, and not losing track, hey, these individuals are classified as black. These individuals are not white, but they are also not black. I think that is a, is a very important distinction. But at the end of the day, the people who are causing the problem are white folks. Those are the people that I want to be very clear, and I would love to get to where we can just isolate and focus on white people and not – spend a lot of time trying to pick out and say, well, this person is black, this person is not black. And I say that because you, you pointed out the so-called mulatto problem uh, and saying that consistently individuals who are not white but have a white parent, they have consistently done things to support the system of white supremacy sided with white. I totally agree. I think we discussed that uh, when you were on the program over this past summer with uh, destruction of black civilization. Uh, Chancellor L. Williams, I think that's one of the main points uh, that he hammers home in that book, uh, the mulatto problem. Is that is that accurate? Am I, am I saying anything incorrect? I think it's absolutely accurate. Okay. I, I'm in total agreement. However, there are a lot of black people who have two black parents 
who have also done a lot of damage against black people and sided with whites. There are tons of those people. So, and I, I just, even beyond just black people, there are a lot of non-white people, even non-white people that are not black, who have done the same thing. I, too, make an effort to point out if this is a non-white person or a black person who has a white pen, I think that's important information, and I tend to expect that person is probably going to do things to support our opposition, whites. I totally agree, and I think that's important information. Do I think that that's something where I would say, well, no, that's not a black person? I wouldn't invest my time in that. I would just make it very clear that this person does have a white person, and I think that's critical, and I would explain why. Uh, the second thing I wanted to point out, um, I like it even better. Yeah, agree with that. The example that you gave with Haiti, and you said that black nationalism, the concept, is much older than 100 years, and you gave many examples uh, with the folks that you mentioned. Did Hannibal and these other folks, did they reference themselves uh, explicitly as black nationalists? Mm, they did not use that term, no. Okay. That's, and that's another thing I would say, because the term black nationalist, because, you, because I see a lack of agreement from black people about what a black person is, what defines whether you're a black person, because I do not see consensus around that term, a lot of different definitions evolve in terms of what it means to be a black nationalist, and even going back and labeling other folks as black nationalists. Uh, that's part of, I think, even Sarah Sudan Seti snatching the label and saying he is a black nationalist. That's another one of the problems that I see with it. And I would just, again, point out what I said from the beginning. We have a system of white supremacy. If black, even if, if those folks, and I'm not saying it to disagree, but even if those folks, Hannibal and uh, the black people in Haiti, even if they are black nationalists, that's not something I would debate. Let's say they are. The system of white supremacy dominated, came to conquer all of those folks. I don't think anyone, at least I'll speak for myself, I cannot look at the state of Haiti today and say that what happened during the Haitian Revolution represents a successful conquest of racism, white supremacy. Uh, and I would say anybody who looks at that, looking at the state of Haiti today, man, I would say we have a lot of work to go that Haiti and every place on this globe is still under the awesome power of racism, white supremacy. And I would even point that out and say that is Another one of the key problems that I tend to see with black nationalism is that it tends to foster a false representation of reality. And when I say that, it tends to minimize the pitiful position that black people are in. Am I saying we shouldn't fight back? Absolutely not. But I think it is critical. I think that's one of the things that we have not done, truthfully, is that we do not make an effort to make an honest, accurate assessment of our opposition and what we will be facing, the white people that we are looking to eradicate. Um, I would take another example uh, that I think nicely coincides with Haiti. During the roundtable, someone listed Tulsa, Oklahoma as an example of black nationalism. I wouldn't contest that. I, I would not argue that at all, but I would say white people destroyed Tulsa, Oklahoma and all of the quote-unquote success that black people had in that area in very short order. They didn't call in white people from all over the world. A few thousand white folks, according to reports that I have seen, in a matter of days, totally destroyed everything black people had constructed in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And that did, did not just happen one time or two times or three times, uh, that happened hundreds of times, maybe thousands of times. Who knows? Elliot Jaspin, uh, a white male suspected racist, he was on the program uh, this summer, a week before we did the program on destruction of black civilization, his book, uh, Buried in the Bitter Waters, America's Hidden History of Racial Cleansing. He wrote that he suspects that that sort of thing happened at least 250 times in the 20th century. That is white supremacy. I tend to see 
black people point at examples of black folks who were working against racism, white supremacy, were working to coalesce with other black people, but they leave out white people obliterated these folks, typically in very short order, and that needs to be considered, like I'm saying, this is not a new idea. We really need to think, has this accomplished the goal, final resolution, ending white supremacy? Thus far, it has not. And let me go back to what I said in the beginning. I think it's very important. It really, it's the centerpiece of the discussion and the disagreement. And you will start with Haiti, and I'll go through example after example, and I'll make this point, and it will make it very clear. The problem with Haiti was not the success that the black people had in destroying the whites and murdering the whites in Haiti. It was the fact that they did not have substantial and significant other black people around the world simultaneously adopting the same mentality and the same behavior. So if you have a little island in Haiti where they overthrow and destroy whites and then end up in, a, in, a, in, a, in an internal war against the mulattoes, who are, the, again, the children of the whites, and then because of that inability to stabilize themselves and gain other assistance from other black people around the world, end up facing the full weight of white supremacy around the world, then that is not the lack of success of the brothers and sisters in Haiti. It means that they had the correct answer. They showed us how to deal with whites adequately, and we did not follow that example properly. And so now the whites can go and say, we do not want people to follow this example because it is the correct answer to dealing with the problem. Let us go and disincentivize them from using this strategy that has been successful. I'll go to America. You talked about Black Wall Street being burned down. It was. Here's the problem with that notion now. One of the things that happens, and you, and you say, you know, we always minimize the power of white supremacy. Yeah, but whites always minimize the power of black nationalism. In other words, you have to pour through and get lucky and learn about the Haitian Revolution. If the Haitian Revolution and the nationalism that was exhibited in Haiti was not important, why is it that whites do everything in their power to prevent black people from learning about what happened in Haiti? Why is it that Robert F. Williams, who during his life was countless times more relevant than Martin Luther King Jr. to the world, was literally written out of history, and we don't find out about him until we're adults. It is because black nationalism has as many victories in it as we would need to encourage all of our people to adopt it and get the final solution. However, like anything, if there is something that if you have an uh, opponent and you know that there's one thing that they can do to destroy you, the, what you're going to do is you're going to do everything in your power to train them against that thing. So the closer they walk towards that thing, the more pain and hell, because your existence and your ability to defeat them lies in the, 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 the hope and the work that you put in to prevent them from getting the final answer. Once they get that final answer, you will be destroyed. So you will do everything in your power from, to prevent them from getting that. I'll give an analogy to try to make it simple what I'm saying. If there was the cracker button, you know, one button that we could push, I'm going to call it the cracker button, not yet the black button. If you could push the black button. I'm sorry. <laughs> we're going to call it the black button. Okay. And this button you pushed and all the crackers disappeared and died okay. instantly. Do you think whites would leave that button in wide open view of black people, or would that button be more secured? Would there be more trained guards around it? Would you have more, would there be any black people within a thousand miles of that button? And if you were black and you tried to go in the direction of that button, do you think the whites would just let you go in the direction of that button? I think you would agree with me. Even if you had no idea what was in that direction, 
if they saw a black person with any, any certain amount of feet to the button, even if they didn't know if the person knew it, they would probably kill us. Is that reasonable to believe that? Um, truthfully, yeah. from what I have seen about the operation and particularly the refinement of racism, white supremacy, uh, I believe uh, the axiom or quote is hidden in plain sight. I think racist man and racist woman would attempt to groom and condition their non-white subjects so that even if they were within an inch of that button, white people would pay attention, they would be very alert, but they would groom their subjects to have zero interest in doing such a thing so that even if they were right there, they would not even think of pressing that button. I think that would be what white folks would do. Now, they would have folks there in case you did look like you wanted to press it to, you know, do their thing and stomp you down, but they would make every effort to condition folks to have no interest. And, in fact, they would condition their subjects to be the ones to go and snatch anyone down who attempted to push that button. I think that's so, what white people would do. But what I'm saying is, essentially what you're saying is, you're, you're, you're making my point even better. You're saying a substantial portion of their work would go into doing everything they think possible to keep some from, from pushing that button. Am I correct? No matter what strategy they use, would they not make sure, and to the best of their ability, that that button doesn't get pushed? Yes, sir. If someone made it clear that they were trying to push that button and were trying to inspire other people to push that button, what do you then think that whites would do? Um, so just say one more. Um, can you repeat the question? If a black person, or what you would call a non-white person, began to go around and advocate that we go and find this button and push it as the answer and solution to white aggression, what would you think the white response would be? I'm going to answer, but I am going to push, because I say this on my program consistently, pay attention to the metaphors. I do not agree with this metaphor, because I do not think so-called black nationalism is the black button to end racism, white supremacy. I do not believe that is the case. And, in fact, uh, I, would, I have to really make that point strongly because I don't see any evidence that white people step out and oppose black people working towards black, so-called black nationalism. I have even had white Wait a minute. Let me stop you. i got to stop you right here. Cause you're not being I asked you a question. Now, earlier, wait a minute. earlier you asked me a question. You said I want a yes or no. 30 seconds. Give me no, no. But I, I hear buckets and buckets of words. Give me 30 I'm asking seconds. A question. Because I don't agree with the metaphor. And that's important. I know. I know you don't agree with the metaphor, but if I ask you a question and you give me buckets and buckets of words, you're kind of going to like the kind of white answer thing. The answer to the question is I believe white people would oppose any effort to move towards that button, but I don't agree with the metaphor. There you go. Okay, but you're saying if there was a button to destroy the white race and somebody said that was not white, began to come out and advocate for the destruction of that button, do you, are you saying that whites would oppose that individual? Am I correct? I, I answered that, I think, twice already, yes. Okay, so if you're answering that yes, then all we have to do is simple. It is very logical. Let's ask ourselves. Who have been the most opposed individuals in the history of America? Let's start talking about the individuals who we know by name who have had the greatest opposition from whites who were black in this country. I think we would agree that Nat Turner is one of those individuals. I think we would agree that Marcus Mosiah Garvey, as evidenced by the fact that they deported him, is one of those individuals. I think we would agree that Elijah Muhammad and the Nation of Islam and all those individuals out of it, Malcolm X, uh, in fact, the largest number of investigative pages on any organization, including uh, any communist organization, any foreign organization, the Ku Klux Klan, the largest number of documented pages of investigation has been against the Nation of Islam. So we would have to put the Nation of Islam in that. Robert F. Williams, who was not only on the most wanted list of the FBI, but also literally was uh, 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 almost eradicated from history. The Black Panther Party, who had a, 
and he literally was the inspiration for a program that grew into what was called the COINTEL, Counterintelligence Program, which spent a significant amount of its time, energy, and resources to destroy that organization. What I would say is when you're looking for a constant theme, uh, Kwame Ture, who had to flee the country because he fled, felt for his life, uh, Dr. Khalid Abdul Muhammad, who was the first man in the history of the United States of America to be censored by the United States government. That is an indication that they see him as a definite threat and a major opposition. <clears throat> when we try to link and find what the common denominator is, and these men and these people, uh, 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 Harriet Tubman, who had, a, uh, who had a bounty on her head, an incredible bounty for the time she was living, if you look at what these individuals have in common, what you will find is a basic fundamental agreement that would best be described, if we were going to use terminology today, as a black nationalist activist mentality, meaning they believe that black people were one group of people and that we had white enemies and that we need to fight against them and resist them. That was generally, some of them even called themselves black nationalists. <clears throat> so if we see that whites fought against those individuals and that they had, and if you can name me some, another group of black people who had greater resistance than these people, a, a, a greater white opposition, then I would like to hear them. But my suggestion would be you won't find them because whites, if you really want to use whites as your parameter, which is pretty much what you're doing when you're saying white supremacy, you're looking at it as the authority. And you are correct. I'm not going to debate you on the fact that it is the greatest power on the planet today, arguably one of the greatest power structure systems in the history of the world. That's, that, that, that can be debated, and someone would have a very good basis to say that. However, if you want to know what threatens it, look at what they fight against. What is the number one philosophy that they fight against in the black community? It is not Islam, even though they fight against Islam. It's certainly not Christianity. They promote Christianity. It is not Judaism. The number one philosophy that whites try to destroy is black aggression against whites, whatever you want to call that. Anybody talking about doing physical harm to whites that is black and advocating and, and pushing things in that direction, they try to target that individual. And the vast majority of the people who have done that and been the most successful would probably and best be described as black nationalists. If I'm incorrect, please tell me what I'm saying is incorrect. Uh, I would not uh, classify Nat Turner or Harriet Tubman as so-called black nationalists. Uh, to, my, to my knowledge, they did not reference themselves as that. Um, I think it would be accurate to say they are victims of white supremacy. I think it would be accurate to say that they uh, were attempted counter-racists. Uh, they attempted to counter the system of white supremacy, but to my knowledge, they didn't. And that's, that's another thing that I said. People can go and have, according to their definitions, and throw that label around on a lot of folks. Another individual that I would definitively say was not a black nationalist, and I don't even have to say it. He said it himself, Robert F. Williams. Uh, if you go to his book, uh, Negroes with Guns, uh, he addresses so-called black nationalism. Uh, and I want to read it to folks. Uh, this is on page. It depends, I guess, on what edition of the book you have. I have the first edition, so if you get the newer edition, the page numbers might not correspond. So I don't know if you have a new edition, kind of go towards the end of the book, uh, and you'll see it. It should be around page 119, might be a page or two off. But Robert Franklin Williams, Negroes with Guns, he has a section titled Black Nationalism, Another Label. The label black nationalist is as meaningless as the communist label. I'll read that again because this is directly from his autobiography. The label black nationalist is as meaningless as the communist label. He goes on and talks about this for a few paragraphs. Uh, he says it is a meaningless, uh, excuse me, a misleading title. Uh, he goes on to say, as for being a black nationalist, this is a word that's hard to define. In my opinion, that is why a lot of people can be thrown under the label black nationalist because it's not clearly defined, 
People have different definitions for it. Sometimes anyone who opposes racism, white supremacy, who is a black person, gets labeled a black nationalist. This happened to Robert F. Williams, and he said, I am not a black nationalist. It is a misleading uh, and meaningless term. Again, Robert Franklin Williams, Negroes with guns. Now, you asked, are there other groups who have been subjected to equal amounts of, I think you said opposition. Can I, can I say mistreatment? Would that be, is that okay? Is that acceptable for you to, to substitute? I just think other individuals in our community. Okay, that have been, you said opposition from whites. Can I say mistreatment? Is that accept, I'm just asking if that's acceptable. No, I think we've all been equally mistreated. I'm saying getting, I, I'm, I'm saying direct opposition where they institute things to fight against those individuals. Okay, 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 I'll take that, no problem. Okay, so direct opposition from whites. You said, have, are there other people that I could name? Yes, I can even name non-black, non-white people. AIM, the American Indian Movement. Cointelpro was on them viciously. In fact, uh, Jim Vanderwall, War Churchill, Agents of Repression, America's War Against the Black Panther Party, excuse me, the FBI's War Against the Black Panther Party and the American Indian Movement. They moved against them and used many of the exact same tactics, including executing non-white people who were working against racism, white supremacy. Now, I certainly don't think anyone would say the American Indian Movement, that's black nationalism. They weren't even black people. According to your definition, they were not black people. White people did not. Wait a minute, wait a minute, you're interrupting. Wait a minute. White people did not identify them as black people, but they identified them as a threat to their system because they were mobilizing, they recognized whites as their enemy, and they were working in opposition to that. They were even working with some of the Black Panther members. Uh, Fred, they, I've seen video. Uh, video documentaries where they talked about how they were inspired by various black people who were working against racism, white supremacy. I point that out to say I don't think you have to be a quote-unquote black nationalist to have white people directly oppose you, including violence. You simply have to be working in the correct direction to oppose their system, and they will be coming for you. You don't even have to be a black person. If you are a non-white person in doing that, White people will be paying attention to you and working in opposition to what you are doing. Also want to make sure I get out real clear, uh, you and many other folks are of the opinion that white people are working to exterminate black people. They are done with the exploitation for cheap labor and other things. They are in the extermination phase. If that is true, Anybody who is espousing so-called black nationalism, really anybody working against racism, white supremacy, who's taking that position, you are on the clock to come up with something that is going to solve this. This idea of black nationalism is not new. You say it's been around for hundreds of years. This idea has not successfully resolved the problem of racism, white supremacy, and I think non-white people, black people, need to be open to having other strategies, other ideas to solve this problem. I do not think it would be logical, rational to look back at ideas that we have tried before that have not been successful at resolving this problem. And when I say success, I do not mean a momentary victory where a few whites are slaughtered and things are okay for a day. I mean the total eradication of this system forever that has never been the result of any of the efforts, any of the individuals that you named, whether they classified themselves as black nationalists or whether you put that label on them, none of them have successfully resolved this problem. We should look at something new. And the <laughs> thing I would say is that in terms of, as you said, Haiti, it didn't work because you did not have enough black people worldwide who were in unison with that spirit of coalescing around being black. What I'm saying is all of the evidence that I have seen, it is unlikely that that is going to happen. Chancellor L. Williams' book, which you call the Black Bible, 
a key component also of what he says in addition to the moment, and it's related to the mulatto problem. Black people do not function as a race. He says that repeatedly. Black people were opened up to all of these invaders. That was a key part of the destruction of black civilization, black people being very open to all these other folks coming in, mistreating them, and taking over their civilization. I still see that to this day. I do not think it is logical, and I do not see any historical evidence that black people are going to coalesce, unify globally around the idea of us being black. I think it would be much more constructive and it would be new because I've never seen black people and non-white people on the whole coalesce around the idea of eradicating the system of white supremacy, focusing on white people as the problem. I have never seen that tried. I think that would be a much more constructive avenue to take. I could be incorrect. Okay. Let me go down. You said a mouthful. Let me knock out each one of these uh, one at a time. Let me start with the Robert F. Williams thing. You are correct. Robert F. Williams said specifically that he was not a black nationalist. However, he said it in the same vein that black people say, I ain't no African. He, he has a lot of black people say they're not an African. Or the, what they're saying is they have no relationship to Africa. Well, they're just ignorant. He was not an ignorant man in the sense, I'm not knocking the man, what I'm saying is, it was a term that was used that he had no familiarity with, did not necessarily agree with the term. However, here's how you know that what he was doing with black nationalism. First of all, everywhere he went around the world, those group of people were practicing some form of nationalism. So he went to Cuba and they were practicing Cuban nationalism. That's why Fidel didn't want to leave. He went to uh, 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 Ho Chi Minh in Vietnam. They were practicing Vietnamese nationalism, even Asian nationalism, where the Chinese were sending in Asian troops, and the Chinese and Vietnamese didn't even get along, but the Chinese didn't like what America was doing in Asia and was sending in Chinese troops in the back door. Were they doing it because they were Vietnamese? No, they were doing it because they were Asians, which was yellow nationalism. And Robert F. Williams was there helping them with that, with the psychological warfare against the black troops as the yellow nationalists and the Vietnamese nationalists were fighting against that war. Secondly, how do you know what he was doing with black nationalism? The whole black nationalist movement that we talk about from the black power movement, which in many ways was started under a nationalist mentality and structure, they labeled their father of their movement. If you talk specifically the Republic of New Africa, a black nationalist organization, was actually asking Robert F. Williams to come back to America to start the revolution. He refused to come back because his interest was not in being the leader of the rebellion. That wasn't his interest, but he was still going to fight back. Even though he did not come back, they made him the president in exile of the Republic of New Africa, the Black Panther Party read his book, Negroes with Guns, and the same philosophy that he produced is what created the Black Panther Party, is what created the necessity for whites to create a Cohen Phil Pro and a counteroffensive to prevent us from actually achieving black nationalism. If you brothers and sisters out there are listening, remember J. Edgar Hoover's letter. We must prevent a black messiah who can electrify the masses under black nationalism and start a real warfare. So here you have the white demon, the white racist, telling you what the threat to his survival is. And he went through and said the individuals. He said, Malcolm X is gone. He's dead. He could have been one. He said, Elijah Muhammad? It's too old. He said Martin Luther King, if he dropped his uh, obedience to whites and adopted a black nationalist mentality, and those are not verbatim, but that's essentially what he said, and he said Stokely Carmichael, 
who uh, a future opponent when he passed with, with Kwame Ture, has the necessary charisma to achieve this goal. So he is identifying. Here's the enemy now telling you what the major threat to their system is. And he's identifying and saying it, it is black nationalism. And he describes what black nationalism is going to do. He says they could develop, electrify that black nationalism could, by his words, electrify the masses, and we could have a real mile mile revolution in America, essentially behind this concept and construct of black nationalism. And so the government's primary resource and interest during that period was preventing black nationalism from being institutionalized as the primary weapon against racism and white supremacy in this country. Now, you really helped me out here, Gus, because I, you know, you, you, know you, were, you, you were putting some things down and making a lot of sense, and I was like, man, you're doing a lot of talking. This is kind of difficult. I don't get a chance to say anything, but then you really helped me out, Gus. You're a real good guy. I really like you a lot. You helped me a lot. You said because I was saying, I asked you a question, and of course you didn't answer that question. I said, are there any other individuals who we would not classify as black nationalists who popped up and um, either weren't identified as if they choose black nationalism would be a threat or who weren't black nationalists who were a threat, and you didn't give me any, but you said the American Indian movement. Well, I want to make my exact point. What would you classify something called the American Indian Movement? You're correct. It's not black nationalism, but guess what it is? It's red nationalism. I mean, the red man and red woman are saying, they didn't just say we're non-white. They said we're, we're Indians, and, and, and we understand they're indigenous, but that's a term that's given to them. But for the sake of the argument, they call themselves American Indians. They said we have a movement, not the Americans who are not white movement. American Indians who, a, 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 who are trying to pull themselves together in a racial classification to develop a nationalist movement, the American Indian movement, not the American We Are the World movement, not the American who are just running against other Americans movement. It's the American Indian movement, a nationalist red movement. So here you see our point being made very well. As you said, the whites were afraid of red nationalism. Yes, they were. And they're afraid of black nationalism. Yes, they were. And imagine if you have red nationalism and black nationalism, both with the full agreement that the destruction of whites is their center, central agreed-upon goal, and they will work together, imagine what we will have. And that's what the whites have imagined, and that's what the whites fought against. Now, so we got those two things. Let's go to what you said. We're on the clock. You are correct. Here is the problem. Again, I'm stating it again, and I don't think you've adequately dealt with that because essentially what you're saying, it's like if you're in a game. Let's imagine we're, fighting, we're playing a football game, and we're losing the game. The score is 40 to 20, and it's in the fourth quarter. Well, you cannot. There are two types of plays. You've got pass plays and run plays. You can't stop running and passing because you haven't been successful in running and passing enough to outscore the person's 40 points. You, you can't stop doing it. You, that, that's not a justification for stopping what you're doing. What you do then is that you have to work harder and be more successful. And you have to say what has been the most successful plays, running and passing, that we have, because those are the two types of plays you have primarily in the game that have been most successful. Okay. Let's see if we can make them more successful. Let's see if we can do something new to it. But you don't stop with your general, uh, uh, general overall idea, except that you try to find a way to make it more successful. The problem with black nationalism, quite frankly, has not been that it has not shown <clears throat> that it cannot destroy white supremacy. I think it has shown the very opposite. I think that it has shown that it is the one thing that we can name that has shown it can destroy white supremacy. And that does not exclude red nationalism. That does not exclude yellow nationalism. Again, Robert F. Williams went to places where he was helping them galvanize yellow nationalism. But the point is, we have never stated the correct 
in gold. In gold. So in other words, for Hannibal of Carthage, his stated goal was to destroy the Roman army and prevent the threat of the Romans from coming into Carthage. He had the wrong goal. Great job. Great war. But when he got to the doors of Rome, he had defeated the army, and, and, and the Roman army now uh, in disarray had decided that they were just going to flee and be where he couldn't find them. So they would just run out and leave the city to be ransacked. In which case, if he had a mentality <coughs> to go in and systematically exterminate the Romans in the city, he could have done that. Here's the problem. There's a problem with African people, not a problem with black nationalism. He didn't have any problem with killing Romans on the battlefield. <clears throat> but in his African mind, he could not bring himself to consider killing civilians, even if they were white, even if they were the enemy to his people. That's a tragic flaw in African people. And it has caused us great dismay, and it has allowed us not to have the proper uh, results out of black nationalism. So here we have a, a, a war that was ultimately lost, <clears throat> not because he did not have the right physical capacity to win it, but because he was not willing to take white life in the way that whites are willing to take black life, thoughtlessly, mercilessly, and with full and absolute aggression with the full purpose of extermination. He didn't think that way. So that was a problem with black nationalism, and if you go even to Haiti, again, Haiti I would not use the same example of because if people know about Denmark Vesey in 1822, who had traveled throughout Haiti during his younger life uh, as a, uh, when he was enslaved, and he, 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 uh, he went back and forth with his uh, enslaver to Haiti, and he became a carpenter, and he played a lottery and won it and was able to buy his freedom. He had galvanized 10,000 black people in the South, again, black people, under the eyes and, and, and concept of what we would have to classify as nationalism, because he's only going to black people. And he had 10,000 of them prepared, and the plan was, now listen to the plan, brothers and sisters, to kill all the whites in South Carolina, and then kill the whites all the way down to Florida, to join with the Seminoles in Florida, and then to invite an invading Haitian army in from Haiti, of which he was obviously in contact with our Haitian brothers and sisters. So <clears throat> we're in the process of using nationalism to do what it is best designed to do, destroy whites. Just because a snitch told before he got off and before the war began, and we did not have the kind of success we'd have had if we'd have launched that war without them knowing, there's not a reason to say we should not have a war like that. We have some kinks in the system. One, we have to deal with the traitors, the internal traitors, the internal black-skinned people who prevent us from having success in fighting racism and white supremacy <clears throat> and who help the whites in keeping us enslaved. We have to have adequate compensation for their misbehavior. We have to have adequate violence associated with uh, uh, treasonous behavior as it relates to black efforts to destroy white power. And when and where we see that this occurs in our teaching of our children and our training of our people, it is critical, I mean, it's absolutely critical that that become part of black nationalism. But in, 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 in stating it simply, the problem of black nationalism throughout the history of the world, it's not hundreds of years old, it's thousands of years old. The problem with it is not that we cannot build great nations, but we have never, as far as I am aware, I do not know in the history of the world, where our stated end result was the complete decimation and destruction of the white race worldwide. And because that has not been the goal or objective, I would say that is the reason we have come up short in our aims and objectives. And further, that is the reason why we get confused. We start off with a black nationalism that says one thing. A perfect example I'll use that is relevant to today. The most honorable Elijah Muhammad started off 
with a nationalism that said, essentially, that black people were gods, and God's people, and whites were devils, and that God wanted the devil dead, and that it was time for the black man and woman to take over the planet, and that the devil would be eradicated. That's essentially what his theology said. It is a black nationalist theology that there ever was such a thing. Now, there may be some things that we don't agree with in there. It was not a perfect nationalism. But generally speaking, those who are familiar with the, 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 the theology understand that the end result are that black people are on top and have rulership of the planet again, and the whites are no more. It has worked, except there are people who come along and begin to confuse the message, begin to integrate, change the message. We have got to become more definitive in not only stating the end result, but maintaining and enforcing the integrity of the end result. The stated end result of black nationalism is the end of the white race as we know it and the rulership of black people on this planet. Why is it that I don't agree with you, Gus, when you say you think that a better approach is to only identify whites as the problem. Sure, I agree. Whites are the problem on planet Earth. That is not a question. However, Arabs are also a problem. I will not try to confuse this discussion by bringing that in there, but what I'm saying is we have one race that we need to completely get rid of, and then we have to determine what kind of relationships we're going to have with these other races. In the process of getting rid of the whites, we may work with a lot of these different races. But these are not all our friends. And because they're not all our friends, and many of them are threats, we need to deal with the situation wisely and understand, like Dr. John Henry Clark said, there are some chapters, there are some dramas that occur in the world where there are no good guys. You know, we always think we, we're used to this concept, good guy and the bad guy. There are some dramas in this world where there are no good guys. And in this situation, I'm going to say we cannot definitively determine what any other race will do. So what we should do is identify the whites as the problem, get as much collective agreement with that as we can, and then find a solution to eliminate them and put ourselves in power on this planet. Now, <clears throat> what exactly that will be, we don't know, but what I'm saying is Black nationalism is what will lead us to the final end result of how to conclude the chapter in white existence on planet Earth. Mm. Uh, I'm going to uh, make my concluding remarks, but I, will have a, I have a question. If all of the non-white people on the planet said white people are the problem, we are going to work for the eradication of white people. Do you think that could potentially solve, bring final resolution to the problem of racism, white supremacy? If they said it and did it, I think it would be fantastic, yes. Okay, so that right there means that there is a clear alternative. We could pick something else. And I suspect there are lots of other alternatives that could be selected that have not been tried yet, haven't been thought of, in addition to so-called Black nationalism. I want to be very clear. The folks that you're pointing out and saying that they had success, that these were the best, our best attempts. Number one, a lot of these people that you have mentioned, Robert F. Williams, Harriet Tubman, never referenced themselves as black nationalists. Uh, that is a label that is being thrust upon them. Uh, even mentioning J. Edgar Hoover, I'm quite certain he did not have the same definition of black nationalism that you do. It has been my experience many times just being a black person in opposition to racism, white supremacy is more than enough to get that label thrust on you, including Gus T. Renegade. I have had it tossed on me, and I'm doing this program. So I think a lot of people easily, and because, like I said, jump, the term's not clearly defined. Uh, at the end of the day, oftentimes, all you have to do is say, I'm against white people, I'm against racism, white supremacy, and you get thrown in the black nationalism. <laughs> At the end of the day, none of these folks have been successful. Uh, even the time out in Kenya, white people exerted a lot more violence against them. If you look at the final tally, they did a lot more damage against the 
black people in Kenya than the black folks of the Mau Mau's did against white people in Kenya. Thus far, none of these efforts have been successful. White people have crushed all of the efforts at establishing so-called black nationalism thus far. Now, you said about the Arabs. Uh, last time I checked, in this area of the world, if you check the census, Arabs are classified as white. I'm not going to get into that to, to, you know, muddy the waters or what have you with the discussion, but if you check the census, Arabs are under the white classification in this area of the world. So that would tell me a lot about so-called Arabs and how I would view them, but neither here nor there. Uh, you said that many individuals, we know white people are our opponents. You said that many non-white people uh, who are also not black are not our friends. I would say again, not every black person is our friend. Now, we can say, well, I'm going to redefine what it means to be black, and that will correct that problem so people that are black who are not against racism, white supremacy, who are working against the interests of black folks supporting racism, white supremacy, they're not black. You can say that, but you're ultimately not going to have the control over who gets classified and accepted as a black person. Now, we can say Clarence Thomas is not a black person. He doesn't function as a black person. Yeah, yeah, yeah. At the end of the day, when you look at him, when white people look at him, that is a black person. Uh, and even worse, you have a lot of black people who are not going to function like Clarence Thomas and get a white wife or blatantly, explicitly do things to support the system of racism, white supremacy. It's demonstrated, uh, I don't know if it was this past Monday, but uh, you, when I, you and I did a program, I don't remember when it was, but we did a program together recently, and someone called in and said, well, I think Jeannie's an agent. And you said, well, people have called in and said, I think Gus is an agent. People have written that on my, on my show page, that they think uh, I am an agent, that I am working for uh, the system of white supremacy. I'm doing things to subvert black folks who are trying to work against the system, and I'm doing things to help white people. What I'm saying is that it is really easy under these conditions for white people to manipulate black people and have black people who look like, who just upon identification, they look like a black person, they appear to be doing things that you might classify as black nationalists, but in fact they are reporting back and supporting the system of racism, white supremacy, just like the folks that you label mulattoes, just like the non-white, non-black people that you say are not friends to black people. At the end of the day, I am saying, as you, I say that I totally agree, you said sometimes there are no good folks. I do not believe that you have a, such a thing as decent people under the system of racism, white supremacy. I don't think you can be a decent person and practice racism, white supremacy, I don't think you can be a decent person and be subject to racism, white supremacy, because even if you are a black person, directly or indirectly, you're going to be doing things to support their system. So I don't believe you have decent people, and I don't believe, and the evidence in my view shows, black people under these conditions cannot honestly say, I have a realistic expectation that black people are going to be loyal to one another. The system of white supremacy is able to compromise that loyalty all the time. Denmark Vesey, compromised by a black person. Fred Hampton, compromised by a black person. Marcus Garvey, compromised by a black person. The list goes on and on and on. What I'm saying is I think for black people, I don't mind when people say, I think Gus is an agent. I like you to have that. Oh, I'm going to correct that. Sorry. Uh, I, can, I can stop that noise. Give me, give me one second. Um, okay. I like people to have that suspicion. I like people to not think just because I'm doing this, uh, to not question my loyalties, to be suspicious, and I think that suspicion should be there as long as the system of white supremacy exists because white people can easily uh, manipulate us. Uh, now, you talked about many of the black people who either classified themselves as black nationalists or black people that you labeled black nationalists, uh, that they were uh, some of the top enemies uh, of white folks, and you cited Pro profiles. 
Martin Luther King Jr. has a massive Cointel profile. I don't think I've ever heard him reference himself as a black nationalist. I've heard him speak out against so-called black power at times. Now, other people argue and say that he switched and, and he later did support it, but hey, I have heard him come out and give speeches saying he was totally against that, and I, I could be out on a limb, but I suspect you would not classify him as a black nationalist. He still has some really beefy FBI cointel profiles because white people did think, now this person is in opposition to racism and white supremacy, he could be a problem. If you are a non-white person or a black person and you oppose their system, you're going to be a problem. If you're a black person, you might get that label of black nationalist thrown on you, uh, but even if that's not the case, all you have to do is take a stance in opposition to white people, and you are going to be in their files. They are going to attack you. And if you look like you could be successful or have the potential to get people motivated behind what you're doing, they're going to focus a lot more energy and attention on you. Um, we already agreed white people, excuse me, non-white people, if all of us worldwide decided, hey, white people are the problem, that's what we're going to focus on, the total eradication of this system, totally destroying white people. That would solve the system of white supremacy. As a black person, I would not know what you label black nationalism if we had no more white people and a system of justice. Black nationalism, that would, not be, that would be totally meaningless. It would be a new issue. We would have justice. Nobody would be being mistreated. And I think all of the non-white people, I think we could get along. I've seen a lot of evidence that if white people got removed from the equation, non-white folks could get along pretty well. And I would be cool in the gang with that as long as nobody was being mistreated. You even cited examples yourself with the, uh, the Seminoles. Uh, Denmark Vesey, he was going to make an attempt to coalesce, work with uh, black people in Haiti and with Seminoles. That, doesn't, that sounds like non-white people working against racism and white supremacy. I would not label that what you call black nationalism. I would label that non-white people, black and non-black, non-white, working in opposition to racism, white supremacy. I don't believe he labeled himself a so-called black nationalist, and I don't think it's important. At the end of the day, I think black people under this system, we have been trained and conditioned to become very fascinated with titles, uh, and labeling ourselves in a certain way, none of that is important. And particularly, I think, is dangerous because we get very fascinated with titles and really don't even come to have a clear understanding of what those titles mean. All of these people that run around talking about black nationalism ask them to explain what it means. It was evidenced on the roundtable there's a lot of confusion. Many people haven't even thought about what this term means or what the term black means. For me, that is a major problem, particularly for a concept that, as you said, has been around for a thousand years or thousands of years. There should be much greater clarity. The fact that I do not see clarity from the vast number of folks that I hear running around talking about black nationalism and the fact that it has not been successful thus far, those two tenants right there lead me to believe this is not going to work, we should be open to other strategies, other methods of replacing white supremacy with justice. Uh, it's not football. We don't just have two options on the table of running past. The mind should be totally open to any solution for the eradication of white people, and you should keep in mind there is a massive population of non-white people, victims of white supremacy, who are not black. I'm sitting next to one right now who has been very helpful in me being able to do my program. If it was not for his help, I probably wouldn't be able to do this program, and I would not have been able to have uh, Dr. Welding on the show many times. This person is not black, but he is not white. He is a victim of white supremacy, and I think if we could get more of those folks on the same page, we could solve this problem immediately. The last thing I will say, the greatest pathology in the world to believe in something just because you wish it to be so. I'll say it one more time since that's my final shot, and that's not me. That is Bobby E. White 
Psychopathic Racial Personalities, and other essays, the greatest pathology in the world is to believe in something just because you wish it to be so. Black people, I think, a part of our victimization, we have been trained to think we relate to other black people just on the basis of them being black. I do not think that is accurate at all. I think that is the programming of racism, white supremacy. We do not need to unite around a group of people, around the idea that we're black, unite around the idea of destroying the system of white supremacy immediately. Your floor, sir. All right. Well, I want to definitively say a few things. First of all, I want to make some clarity in what success is. If you measure success as an absolute victory, then Jim Brown was not a successful football player because he never won a Super Bowl. Yes, he did. Jim Brown never won a Super Bowl. Yes, he did. The Cleveland Browns never won a Super Bowl. Yes, he did. No, the Cleveland Browns never won a Super Bowl. They won, but by the time the Super Bowl came and it was two AFC and NFC came together for a Super Bowl, Cleveland has never won. He won a national championship. I don't know if he won. That's, that's not a Super Bowl. I said a Super Bowl. Okay, okay. Okay, Jim Brown never won a Super Bowl. As a result, as an NFL player, and when there were Super Bowls and he was playing, he's not successful because you got to have absolute victory. It doesn't really work like that in the real world. If you got a guy that goes into a fight with a guy like Mike Tyson, where Mike Tyson, and people just remember when Mike Tyson was the guy who nobody in the world thought that anyone could get in that ring and fight with him. And I'll never forget, there was a guy named Tony Tucker. And this is when Mike Tyson was going down in the first round, just knocking people out. And Tony Tucker fought 12 rounds with him. I'll never forget when I was little and I watched. And Tony Tucker hit him one time, and I saw Mike Tyson, like, kind of, he was hurt by the punch. And I was like, wow, he's a human being. Now, Tony Tucker lost the fight. He did lose the fight. But as a matter of practical analysis, I'm going to say he was very successful. Not only did he do what most men were not able to do, to stand in there and fight with Mike Tyson for 12 rounds, but he showed the people who would later defeat Mike Tyson that Mike Tyson could be beaten. And he showed them how. No, he was not successful in the sense he didn't win the fight. And your object of going into the ring is to win the fight. But if that's the case, Muhammad Ali wasn't successful either because he didn't win every fight. And he didn't win his last fight. So because he lost some fights, and he, and he lost his last fight, his latter fights, he wasn't successful. No. He had many successes. He had many losses. But at the end of the day, if you measure him, you're comparing what he did to others who did that same thing. You would have to give him what we call, I think that it would be reasonable. You don't have to do anything. It would be reasonable to classify him as a successful fighter. Even though he lost a lot of fights. And he lost a lot of ones at the end of his life. The end of his fight career. So I'm saying that to say it is, it is not accurate in my estimation to say that black nationalism has not worked. It has worked better than anything else. Hence, it has worked the best. It may be more accurate to say black nationalism has not solved the problem. Then there is no debate. However, again, it is not that black nationalism has not shown consistently throughout the history of the world that it can resolve the problem. I already stated to you what the issues are. One, we've never stated the end result of white, uh, black nationalism being the destruction of the white race. Two, we, 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 we have not uni excuse me, universally gotten it to the point of making it the primary institution and philosophy of African people that we live by, which would then properly propel us with a collective agreed-upon ideology to fight the ideology of white supremacy so that it is a war. No longer are we victims of the system of racism and white supremacy. We are now accepting members in a war of world conquest against our enemies. When we do that, the only thing, I'm going to be more honest than that, the only thing that is proven as a successful philosophy in fighting 
white demonism on this planet from a black perspective has been black nationalism. Again, we can look at other groups and see that they did not have a we are the world strategy. They had a nationalist strategy. And if they had a nationalist strategy, they were more successful. So why are the Chinese, the yellow man now, and woman, why do they have a nation of their own where they speak Chinese? And why have they been successful in fighting white supremacy? Because they were nationalistic and established Chinese principles and did pull together with the Chinese to fight against whites. Now, did they accept the help of black people like Robert F. Williams? Certainly they did. Did they accept the help of anyone who would help them fight white supremacy? Certainly they do. And what we have to understand is that black nationalism as a philosophy and as what we're going to make an institutionalized, uh, 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 really an institutionalized platform for waging war with white existence on planet Earth, it's not so shallow that we don't accept help from other people. See, just because our primary interest is in pulling our own brothers and sisters together to wage war against our mortal enemies does not mean if a red man wants to do it, I wouldn't help him do it. He has the same objective I have. If somebody else wants to do it, hell, quite frankly, if some cracker wants to kill some crackers, I'm going to try to help him do it. Sure, cracker, I'll help him. And when it's all over, you're going to get done too. I mean, I'm going to help him to get rid of you too. But I will accept your help in killing some crackers. I'm not going to trust you, but... You know, if you know where the, the, the button is, the black button is, okay, crack and share that with me. I need to know where the black button is because I'd like to push it. I don't know about that. Black nationalism doesn't make you stupid and doesn't put you in a box where you cannot accept that there is a strategy to warfare and where you cannot make good uh, and smart alliances at certain times. Quite frankly, as a black nationalist, there may be times when it will be necessary to have a strategic alliance with a Ku Klux Klansman because we may determine at that point that we need to go after the small hats at this moment. And the Klan may want to go after the small hat. We might work together to do that. We're not going to be friends. And when that's over, it's going to you know, ultimately end in his demise. But we work together to get that accomplished. He's not my friend. And I don't rely on that relationship as a platform because if it does not bring itself about then I have lost. And what I am saying, the only group of people that black people can control and can try to control reasonably in the condition we are in in the world today is ourselves. It would be foolish to invest time and energy in a we are the world rainbow bright construct that says we're going to go around and hold hands with everybody that's not white and they're going to be willing to fight white folks. In an effort to do that, where we have not galvanized and created a strong power base, those individuals will turn on us and turn us into the whites and work with the whites to destroy us. If we develop, like the American Indian Movement, a power base where people can look at us and respect our power and see us as a threat to white supremacy, the same as they're facing a threat from white supremacy, they may make the decision. We think that the best decision is to align with these people because they can prevent the issue of white domination on this planet. <clears throat> However, it would not be wise again. I agree that with the red man, we have seen a historical pattern and likelihood that we will be able to get along with them. But I'm not going to go on assumptions. I don't know what's going to happen when we get rid of these crackers and who we're going to get along with. I don't care because if we're unified enough to protect our interests, if somebody decides they don't want to get along with us, then let's be. Let's do whatever it takes. It really don't matter. And we should have that philosophy that we're going to protect our own interests. We deal with the whites because they cross the line and they have to go. And then anybody left has to make sure that they don't cross the same line. And if we have good relations, we do. If we don't, then we don't. But let's not assume what will happen because we didn't assume that whites would do what they did, and they did. We cannot control the behavior of other races. We can only deal with that. In ending, I want to tell people, please go to warmerhorizon.com and then click the live 365 to listen if you're listening on Blog Talk because I think we're going to go and take some questions and answers, or you can call the phone number at 760-569-7676. 
The code is 948656. Again, the dialing number 760-569-7676. Participation code 948656. Since we're attributing all this mighty power to whites and this great wisdom to the white race, I say that I will end my position with somebody white, a white individual who would know more what they see as the greatest threat to white supremacy than someone white who is definitively working in the worst interests of African people. <clears throat> Let's go to our book, War on the Horizon, Black Resistance to the White Sex Assault. On page 107 in the chapter Profiles and Infamous White, white Sex Offenders, from the book, J. Edgar Hoover's FBI Wired the Nation by Dempsey J. Travis. This is a quote from J. Edgar Hoover. <clears throat> he said, we want to prevent the coalition of black nationalist groups. In unity, there is strength, a truism that is no less valid for all its triteness. An effective coalition might be the first step towards a real Mau Mau in America and the beginning of a true black revolution. We must prevent the rise of a Messiah who could unify and electrify the militant black nationalist movement. <clears throat> I'm going to say that again. Prevent the rise of a Messiah who could unify and electrify the militant black nationalist movement. <coughs> Malcolm X might have been such a Messiah. <coughs> he is a martyr of the movement today. Elijah Muhammad is less of a threat because of his age. Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. could be a real contender for this position should he abandon his supposed obedience to white liberal doctrines and embrace black nationalism. Let me say it again. Martin Luther King, Jr. could be a real, Martin Luther King, Jr. could be a very, real contender for this position should he abandon his supposed obedience to white liberal doctrines and embrace black nationalism. Stokely Carmichael has the necessary charisma to be a real threat in this way. J. Edgar Hoover Director of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, March 4, 1968. With that, I close my case, brothers and sisters. I'm gonna hit the phone line. Just in the in the <coughs> just in the interest of uh, intellectual honesty, I did want to point out uh, Jim Brown retired in 1965. Uh -huh. did not start having a Super Bowl until 1967. So I don't think it is uh, intellectually honest to say that he never won a Super Bowl when they did not have a game title, the Super Bowl, until two years after he retired. He did yep. win. He did win a championship. Uh, the the highest game that they had, the championship game that they had before the Super Bowl, he did win that, and he retired in 1965. <laughs> They did not have a game called the Super Bowl until 1967. Okay, that for, for the purposes of what we're doing, it's an analogy. So we'll not use that one because that was not a good one. It was a mistake. Uh, <clears throat> um, Patrick Ewing, Charles Barkley, and uh, Dominique Wilkins. According to the idea that that they have to get an a, a NBA ring, and this is something I'm, I'm certain of now. Neither Charles Barkley, nor Patrick Ewing, nor Dominic Wilkins got NBA rings. It would not make sense, in my opinion, to say that those individuals were not successful. So in the interest of, as you say, intellectual honesty, 
the point is still the same. The question is, do you have to have the absolute victory in everything in order to achieve what we call success? Or is that not a reasonable way to look at success? And should we be more mature and more sophisticated in how we identify what we call success? Going to the phone lines. Thank you for the clarification. Going to the phone lines. Uh, well, before I, Justice, did you did you have anything you wanted to? Oh, he's not. He's, uh, Lost you. Uh, if Justice, if you want to dial back in, oh, she is on the line. My fault, Justice. If you have a, uh, do you want to say anything before you get the phone line? No, not at this moment. Thank you. Uh, going to the phone lines, Mr. Nero. Mr. Nero, you have a hand up. Did you have a question, comment? Uh, hold up. May I be heard? Yes, sir. Oh, wonderful. Um, my, my, I've been listening, and I don't think it's either or. Um, I, I think we can actually apply both because I can see where if we don't have a, a nation, I can see how other so-called nations um, could possibly still continue to abuse us even though racism, white supremacy has been eradicated. So... And I certainly don't want to be the only group of people on the planet without a nation. Um, you know, it, 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 to me, it's, um, that almost equates to being homeless. Uh, and, and as it stands today, uh, black people in this area of the world don't really have a place to call home. Uh, now, I may be incorrect in making that assessment, but that certainly seems to be the case to me. And on the other hand, on the flip side of that, I do think we're going to need all non-white people in order to eliminate this problem. So I don't want to say it's either or. Uh, I think it, I think we need to use both strategies in order to solve this problem. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Thank you. Appreciate the, the commentary. Uh, Tater Pye, she wrote in, she said she believes that we have so-called black nations now. Uh, and they are not working out too good. Uh, that was her comment. Um, and Vickers, oh, he has a show. I can promote Reckless 2.0. He has a show here at Blog Talk Radio where they discuss racism, white supremacy exclusively, nothing else. Uh, he said that, uh, I'm going to read exactly what he said. Give me a, a moment so I can pull the type up. Uh, he said, okay, he said, uh, the Chinese are successful because white people allow them to be. They are still being exploited, and 60% of them are starving. I could be incorrect, though. That was his comment. Um, person who called in from a blocked number. Blocked number, did you have a question or comment? Is that me? Yes, ma'am. Greetings. I have a question for you, Gus. Um, let's say that somehow white people were eliminated and you eliminate the system of racism, white supremacy, what would then be done to prevent the Chinese from doing to Africans in Senegal what they're doing now as far as destroying their economy, running the people out of business, mistreating them, practicing, you know, I guess you would say bigotry toward or mistreatment toward them? Replace what would be put in place to prevent them from doing that to those black people? Replace white supremacy with justice. You have a great number of non-white people who are not black and black people who do not support the idea of justice. That is not mistreating anyone for any reason and the person who needs the most help getting the most help. So I suspect even if all white people were eradicated, there are a great many non-white people who are not black and black people who would be interested in taking white people's place, and that problem would have to be addressed. Replace white supremacy with justice. So you don't, you don't see a need to protect the interest of African people being that ever since we've had civilization, there have always been outsiders coming in to try to take what we have and mistreat us and subjugate us? I would like to toss white people out of the equation, totally eradicate white folks, and then see if we could set up a system where everybody could get along peacefully 
worldwide. I would like to be able to stretch my feet out on the entire planet. It's huge. I think someone said, Dr. Uh, Khaled Muhammad just said Africa was the throne. Black people ruled the entire world. I think that's what he said. I would like to see a system of justice in place worldwide so I don't have to feel like i got to stay on the continent of Africa to be safe. I want to be in a system where I'm not mistreated anywhere. It is a huge planet. It is an enormous universe. I want to be a universal, just man. Uh, a person who called in last four minutes, 5301. 5301, did you have a... Uh, question, 5301. Can I be heard? Yes, sir. Uh, good evening, Brother Gus and uh, Irritated Genie. Uh, very good uh, discussion this evening. I'm actually really glad that you touched on the Denmark VC. I was actually reading that earlier today. Uh, in term, uh, I have a comment. Um, those who are identified as black being born in America are a hybrid so that we're the hyphenated ones. We call ourselves African Americans, whereas first Americans who are Native Americans that, who are considered the indigenous ones, um, as he was talking about earlier under the American Indian Movement, um, I think that we can learn a great deal from their failure and, and their successes within their movement as well as a lot of the failures and successes within the black movement uh, for liberation, the liberation of black people. And moving forward, I think that we should keep the option open, you know, uh, that uh, for those individuals who classify themselves as white identified persons who may want to uh, teach their brethren or sistren about uh, the reality of racism, white supremacy, because um, either way, one way or the other, if that doesn't work, then we could always go with the movie 300 option, because there's a lot more of us than them. Uh, did you did you want to respond, uh, Gene, or... And, well, this is what I'm doing. If a person asks me a question, I want to do it. But since we kind of had our thing, I want to give the people a chance to talk. If, if, if a person is wanting me to respond to something, kind of let me know that you're asking a question or want to respond, because otherwise I want to open up the floor for the people to say what they want to say. So uh, the brother can tell me, was he was he looking for a response or? No, uh, I, I just wanted to just more specifically say that I appreciate the way the dialogue has gone in the last week or two. I followed the Sarah Seti conversation, and um, I think it's correct and that you're talking about uh, the dirty glass of water and the clean glass of water, and, and it is a reality that he speaks to a younger demographic and a more combustible demographic, but the reality of it all is is that even when you look at the movie Malcolm X, at some point when the brother came into the diner and he said, I never heard a Nick, and then he said, I never heard a Negro speak or a colored man speak to no officer like that. Because even if you're a street element oriented individual, at some point you got to recognize that we're supposed to uplift ourselves and be better. And said he knows better. And he wants to be the Lord of the Fools, and I, I don't agree with that. I think that uh, he's a brother who has a great deal of possibilities, but uh, I, I, I commend you for calling him out on that, and I also respect the fact that you left the branch extended that if the brother wants to do the right thing, he could do the right thing. So that's my question or comment to that. Thank you for calling in, sir. Uh, person, different person called in from a block number. Different person, did you have a uh, question uh, or comment? Hello? Yes, sir, we can hear you. 
Oh, thank you. Uh, greetings to you, Gus, and Irritated Genie. Um, I just wanted to say that nationalism is a glorified tribalism. I have a unique position where I am a part of a nation, federally uh, recognized nation, uh, Native American nation. And we we beef with other tribes and, and other so-called nations ever since I was, you know, it was always been a beef, so many different beefs. Um, nationalism is, is is tribalism. So I feel like if you have to have a unity or a unifying uh, part, just calling yourself a, a, a nation is going to disunify you from other so-called nations. That's that's just going to be the case. Now you have the Moors; they consider themselves a nation. You have the nation; these are black people. You have the nation of Islam. You have the nation of gods and earth, which are the five percenters of uh, nations, and they're fractional. They're fractionalized. And it, you know they don't get along, so I really agree with uh, white, non-white. That's it. That's the only way. If you need some type of uh, unity to win, that's the only way you're gonna have uh, any type of unity. So if that's you know in big numbers or whatever, white, non-white. That's it. Nationalism. Is, is, um, and I would say this: if I didn't have a filter. Uh, I would be very confused right now if I if I didn't have a filter way to uh, figure out what um, what real what the reality was. If I didn't have a system, I would be I feel like I would be confused. So, um, Jeannie, you, or if you you could take callers, but I would be interested in what you think, uh, Jeannie, about these other so-called black nations and how they don't get along. Uh, what I would say is. Actually, I take the complete reverse of your opinion. I think that the actual what black nationalism does is it detribalizes. Um, I'll give you I'll give you a historical example. It's actually the exact reverse. Uh, if, if you're talking about uh, a great example of it, look at Shaka Zulu. Uh, Shaka Zulu was in a situation when he took over the Zulus. The Zulus were not a particular. <clears throat> uh, they they were only a little small group. When he took it over, there were many different groups spread throughout Southern Africa, and he began to notice that uh, they weren't unified, and he wanted to create a power base to protect the interests of the people in that region. So what he started doing is he started going around to the, if there was a group as strong as his or as big as his, he would go and sit down and negotiate with them and say, look, we need to come together under one unified agreement. <clears throat> Let's come together. And then if there were groups that, uh, you know, were smaller and didn't want to do it and refused to do it when he went and talked to them, then he'd go to war with them. He said, okay, you're going to unify. But he didn't go to, to kill all the group. He went to war after they won, then he made them join the group. But what he did was that he took, and they had something called an Ibuto, or I'm a Buto, and then an Ibuto. And basically what that was, when a young boy hit, I forget the name, age, but was around 13 years old or so, he would come from wherever he was in the land. And he was part of his little group or whatever, but they would all come to the center of the Zulu land, and they would follow the men and be trained to become a man. And they would be there probably from the time they're 13 or so until they're 30, or 25 or 30, something like that. And so they spent 15 or, or, or years or so there learning how to be men. And it was only after that time they spent there that they could now go back to their particular regions. But while they were there, they were part of what they called it an Ibuto, which is their little clique, their little group. And then you, if whatever region you were from, you would put in the Ibuto with different people from different regions. So you all began to see yourselves collectively. So what happened is when they left their Ibuto and went back to be the men in, in, their, in, in their groups, now they didn't see themselves as this little tribal group. Now they saw themselves as a Zulu and I have members of my Ibuto in all the different regions, and all of them are Zulus, so we're all one people. 
it was that foundation that was laid by Shaka Zulu that when the Europeans waged war on the Zulus, allowed the Zulus to fight them in such a way that we even have black people left in Southern Africa right now. Because quite frankly, if it was not for that foundation that Shaka Zulu laid of trying to weed through the tribalism by a mix between uh, uh, negotiation and warfare. You know, we're going to talk to some people, we're going to crack the people in the head, but we're going to be unified. It was that strategy that created the Zulu nation, which was, a, was able to withstand some of the onslaught of white supremacy to the degree that they allowed there to still be some African people in Southern Africa to fight against racism and white supremacy, even until this day. And so I'm saying, I think it's the reverse. What nationalism does, it takes away your tribalism and makes you part of a larger group. Another example, since you say you're part of a Native American group, let me be more specific. Study Pontiac. Pontiac was one of the most successful Native American, indigenous, red men, uh, red leaders in the history of this country. And what he did was he brought a whole bunch of different groups together and said, let's stop fighting with each other and arguing about this. We are going to all systematically put the Europeans out of this country. He had defeated the English and all but there was 11 forts, and he had conquered nine of them. There was only Fort Detroit and one more fort that were left. And he was, on the, he was right on the cusp of complete and absolute victory on expelling the Europeans out of this country when they tricked them and gave them some blankets with smallpox. Excuse me, I'm sorry. Tricked them and gave them some blankets with smallpox. So they did, they, we still, they still lost. The Native American, the red man still lost, but he lost because he doesn't know how to have hatred for his enemy and to be committed to his demise and not to look for any friendship from him and to understand the devil is wicked. He did not lose because of his nationalism. Once he became nationalistic in his thinking and saying we're red, it don't matter what tribe we are, he was able to successfully wage war against Europeans, putting them on the cusp of complete victory. Are you good, uh, 909? You good, or...? Yeah, I I disagree. I disagree. I'm sorry to even say that, but I'm just thinking, um, you know, when you were talking about the reason why the Haitian uh, the Haitian Revolution didn't have more success was that there wasn't a uh, unifying uh, global African uh, unification. And like I said, uh, if you have nations, you're going to have beef. Like I said, in 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 the, in the uh, Native, uh, in a native, all the tribes, all the nations, they they beef all the time. But like you said, when they, when you come together, and you say, okay, I'm gonna put that nation, that that tribalism, that nation, that nationality aside, and we're gonna focus on the enemy. I noticed that when people do that, when that's the set focus of, let's say, a, a powwow or something like that, to this, that's that's when things get done. It's like let's drop the uh, the nationhood, the nationality, the isms, or whatever. Let's drop the half blood, full blood argument. Let's drop all of that. We got a common enemy. Is you know we got too many white people coming to the powwows. I mean, you can just see a dramatic difference in you know just in just the people, the energy of the whole thing is when you focus on the enemy, you focus on the on on the white. Man, it's non-white, white. It's a whole different, it's a whole different energy. So I just don't see how, uh, if people really understand what tribalism, like I said, nationalism is nothing but glorified tribalism. If people understood that, there's no way you would want to be a part of uh, a gang. This is a gang. That's it. That's all it is. I'm done. Thank you, 909. Uh, to support black people who are working against racism and white supremacy, uh, because he made a comment. They actually are doing a program later this evening. Uh, it will be 11 p.m. Eastern, uh, 8 p.m. Pacific, uh, and they will be talking about the uh, Tyler Perry monstrosity. Uh, um, anybody, if you want to tune in and uh, get more information, I, I suspect they are not in support of that work. I think they're also going to be talking about the uh, the video that just came out of the postal worker and the white woman. Um, she called him cheap. 
I always say I quote when white people. She calls him a nigger repeatedly uh, and smacked him, and I think he lost his job. I, I haven't seen anything where anything happened to the racist white woman. Are you telling me he lost his job? Yes, he was fired. He has a group. Nah, no, sir. I'll send you. Uh, I'll send you a link after the show. But yes, he was fired, uh, and I have not seen anything where any repercussions, any consequences were heaped on the racist white woman who assaulted him. But I'll send it to you after the show. But I think they'll be talking about that uh, on their program. So it's right here at Blog Talk Radio, Reckless 2.0, and they are black people, black people. Um, the folks who called in on free uh, free HD line, uh, I believe this is Sister Natasha. Uh, your line is open. If you have a question or comment, Sister Natasha. Uh, yes, how you doing, Lieutenant hey, Jenny? How you doing, Brother Gus and Justice? Um, I would just like to know what replacing white supremacy with justice actually means. What does that entail? And, I mean, does that mean just being friendly or nice or polite? Or what, what, what does that actually entail? It sounds like a a nice slogan, but it, it, it doesn't really have any, it doesn't really have any, like, any concrete meaning to me. It's probably just like education on what exactly that, does that mean. I must, I'll take that one. I, I'm certain that you mean. Um, before I answer, I will say I think – I could say the exact same thing about so-called black nationalism. Uh, and I think if you listen to the roundtable, you would have to say the same thing about black nationalism. Uh, to me, that does not just mean hold hands, we are the world. That means really being dedicated to the idea of we are totally intolerant of mistreatment. This is a humongous planet, a humongous universe. There are ample resources. Everybody should be able to exist optimally and to thrive to their fullest potential. If we get rid of white people, I believe we could get along, we could achieve that, and quickly, quickly, many times, black people and other non-black, non-white people have unified and worked together many times in opposition to white supremacy. And many times you talk about something that has upset white people Many times, that has, oops, sorry about that. Hang on one second. This is one person called. Um, my apologies. Hopefully they'll. Uh, okay. Anyway, many times that white people seeing black people and other non-black, non-white people coming together in opposition to racism, white supremacy, that has provoked Fury like no other. The Seminoles were mentioned. Uh, the racist Andrew Jackson went to war against the Seminoles. The whole trail of tears, a lot of that was motivated because white people went and saw Seminoles and black people together. They were assisting black people who were running away, getting off of plantations. They were furious when they saw this and went to war uh, with the Seminoles in Florida because of this. So for me, the idea of justice no mistreatment by anyone. I think everybody, we, we really could get along and have a fantastic planet uh, and thrive like no other. Uh, I haven't seen a lot of evidence. Renuko Rashidi and these folks saying that black people were the ones that migrated to all these other places in the first place. Uh, before the Mayflower, I think we were pretty cool before white people got involved and messed everything up. And I think we could have that again and quickly if everybody realized the problem is white people. Let's unify around the idea of total eradication of the system of white supremacy, the total destruction of whites. Does that answer your question? Uh, yes, but on on a, on a, on a, sort of in the same vein, I have not heard anything here tonight that says that the concept of black nationalism negates uh, cooperation with other races. And I also think that just by the very definition of nation, and I'm going by a source that you all used previously, dictionary.com, is a large body of people associated with a particular territory that is sufficiently conscious of this unity to seek or to possess a government peculiarly, peculiarly, peculiarly its own. So 
I don't see, I think that every every race of people has a historical connection, a link to a land, a language, and a certain culture. And I don't think that a so-called non-white alliance uh, precipitates the eradication of those individual ethnicities and cultures and traditions. And I don't think that it has to in order for us to work together to eradicate white supremacy. Um, I think that it's a matter of education and making sure we spread the word among all non-white people that this is indeed your enemy and not somebody to be handled with kid gloves or to be looked upon as some sort of benefactor or friend. Uh, on, on that same token, I think that it's important that people maintain their connections uh, to their historical lands, cultures, traditions, and, and languages, and everything else. I don't, I don't see, and I think that that is a major focus of black nationalism is to galvanize, or, or even red nationalism, or yellow nationalism, or what have you, is to galvanize a people, and you, you maintain a continuity to these things that, that make you who you are. Would you agree or disagree? Um. I just want to make sure what I'm uh, what I would agree. I think you can have uh, non-white people coalesce around the idea of destroying white people and the system of white supremacy, and still retain whatever uh, their quote unquote culture is, their individual culture, whatever things that they do that make them a distinct group of people. Uh, certainly, so I think it would probably look a little different once racism white supremacy comes around, but I have I have no problem with that. If people want to retain whatever uh, distinct languages or anything else uh, that defines them, that they feel is important and constructive, that they want to preserve and maintain, no problem there at all. Did, did that, is that what you wanted, or was there more? No, that's fine. Uh, to, to speak to what the, the gentleman, I, I don't know if he was the previous caller, or maybe the one before that, um, that said that, nationalism is just a glorified form of tribalism, it seemed like he, he kind of like was devaluing the concept of nationalism because we all, it's all, it's in everyone's best interest to get rid of white people. That, that is the fact that everybody agrees on, it seems like in this particular, uh, this, this, this show, this, this conversation, people that call in and everything kind of have a consensus that that, that is, what the solution is, is to remove the whites. Um, I don't see how, you know, I, I don't think that the two are mutually exclusive where we all have to, you know, ignore who we are and where we come from and what our individual traditions are in order to do that. I think that it's prudent that we, you know, collectively galvanize, you know, in, in our own in our own in our own collectives, and then get together and then eradicate this enemy. That, that's just where my point of view. Is. So thank you. No worries. Thank you for calling in. But let me let me say I want to say two things. I'm um, full of, <clears throat> of salt in the game here, but uh, two things. Just as you know, we talk about nationalism. The proof is in the pudding. Racism, white supremacy, in its simplistic term was the simplistic reality is white nationalism. It's an agreement among whites that they are a collective group that can conquer and destroy everybody else. So it would make sense that black people would have a, a nationalism and that other races would have a nationalism too, if for nothing else but to destroy that or fight that nationalism. And secondly, I would say, I'm going to be honest. I'm a student of Millie Fuller and Dr. Francis Cross Wells, and I love their works. But one thing that I always thought, and she brought it up, so I'm going to mention, I have never been comfortable with the description of replacing white supremacy with justice. And that's why we say we want to replace it with black dominion. I tell you why. And this is, and this is my personal opinion, and I, have, I, I fully accept the fact people may not agree with that. But as a nationalist and as an African, the way I look at the world is, I want, because I'm an African, I want what's in the best interest of black people. That is where my major uh, identification comes with. It's not with people in general, humanity, or fruits and vegetables and animals. It's with black people. 
as a consequence, I trust that my people, if we take over and are operating in our proper mindset, will give the best form of government and rulership over this planet as evidenced by our history. Historically, before whites came to power, we had plenty of documented proof that we were not existing in a world and we were not unfair to other groups as it relates to government. <coughs> oh, my goodness. I, I, I was doing good. Two and a half hours. We were supposed to stop a half an hour ago. I was doing good. Okay. We were, we were reasonable and, 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 and decent in our treatment. I've been trying to stop this fair word. I've been doing pretty good. He got me that one. We've been reasonable in our treatment of other races and other groups. And so I think that, honestly, I really don't care. I'm probably not going to be here. But I feel much more confident if black people take the position, after the white's rule is done, we shall rule. And even if, it, even if we say the yellow man can rule his region, we're going to rule all of Africa. The red man can rule the western hemisphere. And the red man and the black man and woman will be friends. Black man and woman the red man and woman will be friends. This is, my, this is my vision. We'll be friends. We'll travel back and forth. If anybody on this planet gives y'all some problems, give us a holler. We'll take care of it. We'll join in with you. If we get some problems on the east side, we, we ask y'all to come over here and help us. And, 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 and the sons and daughters of Chavez and the sons and daughters uh, of Khaled can, can live as friends. And the rest of the people in the world, if they, you know, whoever is left, can just make sure that they don't cross any of us. And we should, we should not have any conflicts. But if we do, I don't want to be in no we are the world mentality as African people and go through this whole problem and situation again. I think it is a superior position to give something that has more of a definition to say what we're looking for is black dominion and rulership by our people than it is to use a word like justice because it's hard for me to really make that tangible. But that's my opinion. Okay. And I, just, I will throw in, it is, I think, has been evidenced repeatedly that black nationalism it has also been very difficult to make that tangible. Uh, and uh, I think since white nationalism was brought up, I could be incorrect, but I think white people, they coalesce around the idea of white people dominate the universe. They do not coalesce around white people, we're going to get together and unify on a personal level. White people argue and beef amongst each other all the time, but they do not let that impede the idea that regardless of whether or not we don't get along, I may hate you, we should be in domination over all non-white people. I think that's very different than looking at it as white people saying that we are supposed to coalesce and agree, get along with everybody who is right. I don't think they look at it that way, but I could be, I could be incorrect. And, and I would say in answer to that, I, I don't think that that's what we're saying. I think we're saying by very definition of what you just said, that's white nationalism. They fight and argue amongst each other, but their collective agreement is that they will dominate and destroy other races, and, and, and they will dominate this universe. You're right. That's white nationalism because that is what they coalesce around, the whiteness. And so they see themselves as a collective governing body that has the right to govern. No matter which one of them, it's one of them that should govern. That is nationalism by its, its fundamental definition. Actually, I guess the only thing I would toss in, I wouldn't use that as white nationalism because that, I think the focus becomes too narrow. They dominate the entire universe. Um, like, there's nowhere you could go. I think nationalism, it tends to focus people on a small area of land, and I don't believe that's how white supremacy works. It's the entire known universe. Mars, Pluto, anywhere we go in the galaxy, we are supposed to dominate. I think that that is a very – white nationalism, I don't think, gives that same – uh, understanding of what's happening on the planet and in the universe. That's why I don't use that term. I, I generally stick to white supremacy, white domination. And 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 this this this, this, this is a, uh, uh, I think this is a good place to say I can I can completely I can this is one place that I can say I can agree with what you're saying. I don't, but I can agree with it because it makes good sense. I would say when I hear white nationalism it does give me that sense because I don't think of a landmass. I think of whites wherever they are thinking that they have the right to do whatever they want to do to anybody, and they've agreed upon it, and they'll work together to accomplish that goal. So, so when I see white nationalism, I see it in 
doing whatever it is they do to dominate this planet. When I say white nationalism, I can understand how somebody seeing nationalism, looking at it as a nation is a plot of land, England or London, and something like that might not see it that way. But it has the same, for to me, nationalism is not just about a part of land. There, there should be land associated with it, but it's about a collective agreed mentality that can be, be, be exhibited in land. But, but I'll say this. Because we were spread throughout the diaspora of this world and because Pan-Africanism was the concept to say we were all Africans, we are all one collective people, my sense of nationalism, even for black nationalism, is not land-based. We have a land base that is Africa where I would just say that we should put everybody out and say nobody can be here but African people and maybe Native Americans, red man and woman, you know, Hispanics, if they want to come back and forth as friends, but nobody else can live here because we haven't had good relations. That's my opinion that we should say, you know, ban everybody from the continent. That's a land base. But if they're Africans in Brazil, we're going to look out for their interests too. If they're Africans in America or anywhere else we live, we are a collective family. So to me, nationalism doesn't mean a physical nation. It means a mentality that says that we're a oneness of, of a race of people that have a whole construct of things that we agree to that call us a collective people. A uh, person who called in from an anonymous number, uh, did you have a question and or comment? Um, I guess that would be me. Hey, everybody. Um, I Oh, there's so much I want to say. <laughs> Listen, I was wondering what would um, – I've come to the conclusion that I don't think we as black people are going to be able to unite based off the fact that we are black. I just don't see that happening because uh, racial white supremacy has just done such an excellent job on us. I don't see that happening. Uh, I was wondering, and I have been waiting to see if – there would be a group of black people who truly, truly desire uh, to rule over themselves and to be free from white racial oppression and domination, why don't we come up with our own declaration of independence and we write this up and we submit it to, you know, the powers that be, if that's the presidency or whatever, we submitted also a copy to the African countries. I do believe that every race of people have a right to have some territory of their own, and I think this is the black man's dilemma, him not really having any territory that he can call his own and control. He must have that. You know, that there's just no way you can really actualize yourself as a man without your own territory where you can live the way you know you need to live, uh, protect your women, raise your children in that way. I, I don't have, I, I haven't seen black men get together and really focus on that issue is claiming some territory. And I think that that has to be an issue that has to be addressed, having some territory. What would be the most logical place for the black person or the African to reside. Is that going to continue to be here in America, knowing that whites are, I mean, they're going to be cool as long as you don't try to compete with them, but as soon as you start expressing any type of economic um, competitiveness with them, then you see their real face come out. And I think that's why um, a lot of the, um, the Black Wall Street and the Rosewoods um, from what I study, why those ventures didn't work is because you always had blacks who want to still have that close relationship with whites, and they, they thought that they could integrate with whites and have whites living next to them, seeing them succeed and rise up, and that, that hatred and that jealousy that's in them of seeing blacks being able to compete on an equal level with them, it brings out their um, <coughs> violent nature. And I think it's, this is what black people have chosen to underestimate when it comes to whites. Whites did not bring us over here for us to compete with them. They, they, they're just not going to allow it to happen. So, you know, we're going to have to decide where do we want to live, where do we want to call our own. And I personally think Africa is for the African. You know, I think we have to state that claim. 
Um, are all black people going to agree on that? It, it's clear that's not going to happen, but I feel like we who do agree on that, we have to come up, or this is just a suggestion, with some type of declaration of independence. We're going to have to sit down and we're going to have to write it up. And just like when white folks wanted their independence from, um, from the crown and from uh, Britain, they did a declaration of independence. Why can't we do the same thing? Why can't we draw it up? list the crimes, list why we no longer should have to sit here and try to make these people love us, you know, and write it up, submit it to the powers that be, submit it to the world. You know, we can send a copy to China. We can send a, a copy to wherever, but I think it's time for black people who truly want to be free to take a stand, and we can't just talk about it. We have to have some document that really expresses our sentiments, and once that's kicked off, of course, there's going to be a lot of media press, and people are going to want to know how serious are they about this. I don't think we should be uniting with any other races of people. Black people have been set at a disadvantage for so long. we got to unite with ourselves, and we need to do that without the interference of Mexicans, Indians, or nobody else. The hell with them. We got to get our stuff together. We've got to black has to reunite with black and we can't do it if we're always including all the other races until we get our stuff together. So I don't even think we should be talking about, okay, who are we going to include? Who are we going to let be our friends? You know, that's irrelevant. The black man and the black woman has to get back together and become friends again. We got to work on that. That's that's gonna take several generations right there. So that's that's what I would like to see happen. I think there's a need for a declaration of independence. I think we do have the right to have dual citizenship. I'm not saying go back to Africa, but Africa should be for the Africans. We should research that there's plenty of land over there. Some of that land needs to belong to the Negro from America. And we need to work on making that happen. And, you know, hey, for those who still want to stay in America and, and, and still try to live out the American dream, fine. But um, I, I think our ancestors are waiting, waiting for us to step up to the plate and demand some territory and confront this white man. Because, I mean, their time to rule is up. But personally, I really don't see anybody black ready to take the power. And like I said, how can you have power without land? You've got to have some territory. You know, you've got to have some territory. So this is what we have to address. Where are we going to live? And with so many black people talking, we was already here. We ain't from Africa. I'm Hebrew. I'm this. We're not going to come together. So those who are pan-African or nationalists, I think we need to start from there. I think we're not going to be able to unite off color. But uh, for those of us who do um, agree on that there should be a pan-African nationalist uh, concept or agenda that we should take, then we need to just get together and draw up our Declaration of Independence and take it from there. And then the other blacks who feel like that that's not the way to go, once they see us making some progress and seeing that the, the opportunity of actually getting some land, because I do think it's, um, I think it's divine that the blacks are supposed to have their own land. I don't know where it's written, but I just feel it's pathetic that blacks are, are to be free one day and have their own country and land, but we ain't asking for it. We ain't demanding it, and we ain't making no attempts to get it. So I think that once we demand it, ask for it, and make attempts to get it, I think, you know, the universe is going to move in the direction to give us the desires of our heart, but it's not to have our own land to be what white people was to us. You know what I'm saying? So everything that has divided us, we're just going to have to drop that. We're just going to have to let it go. If religion is an issue of contention, we've got to let it go. You know, but we do have to have some set rules of who is black and who is not. I, I think that has to be clear because, like you said, you're going to always have infiltrators. You're going to always have imposters. And white people are going to do what they've always been good at doing is sneaking people in to upset your, 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 your program or your agenda. So, I mean... That's just my feelings. I'm going to shut up now. <laughs> and I appreciate the comment.
conversation. I'll pass it on to somebody else. Thank you, sis. I thought it was an excellent, excellent, excellent uh, input. I just want to say one thing to what you're saying, and I really appreciate the sister's spirit. I think she was uh, very spirited, but I have to correct one thing. She said that whites in America got their freedom from the British by writing a Declaration of Independence. I would challenge that. I would say whites got their freedom from whites in Britain by killing British. And there's nowhere on this planet that a black person can go where whites don't have access and a military that can come and destroy it. So it is my position that it is true that we need our own land. It is true that we need our own nation. It is true that we need our own everything. But that the way to get that is to eliminate the white race because We've tried to do it and not eliminate them. And if there's one thing that has proven it doesn't work, is building black civilization and maintaining it while whites are on this planet. Uh, I would agree completely. Um, I don't think writing a declaration while you still have a total system of white supremacy is going to accomplish much. Uh, you have to be able to enforce uh, whatever your beliefs, ideas are, uh, and ultimately that's going to mean violence against the white people. So uh, until we get on that page, I don't really think the uh, – I, I see a lot of black people who have a lot of land. Uh, they're still subject to uh, racist, white supremacists, and white people frequently come and boot them off that land when they feel like it. So uh, until that problem is squashed, until we hit the uh, – you said the black button. You said the cracker button at first, and then you switched to the black button. I like the black button better because – it's our button. We black, and you push that black button, and what the black button should do is get rid of the whites. I mean, what better function would a black button serve than to get rid of all the whites? Help me out with that, brother. I, I, I have no disagreement. I just I thought cracker button that uh, okay. spring to it. But I, no, no, you, can keep you know that. what? You know what? The black button is the cracker button. Okay. Okay. It, 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 it has two names. Okay, I can dig it. I can dig it. I can dig it until the black button is or pushed. Black button. Thank you, thank you. Uh, yeah, it's it's not gonna make a difference how many acres of land we have and declarations rewrite. It's just uh, pieces of paper. Um, <laughs> white people come and and shred and make confetti out of and then toss the black people uh, wherever they want them to be. So uh, until that is solved, I don't think that's going to correct the issue. Uh, that is everybody that called in. Um, Taylor Pot, she did, she wrote in, she said, even black people who have the land and things to make money, uh, white people buy for cheap, so they are still left poor. I would agree with that. White people, I mean, that's what white supremacy means. White people dominate all areas of people activity until non-white people, black people understand what that means. I don't think this problem is going to be solved. Um, we have like eight minutes. Um, did you want to uh, get out anything before uh, we, we wrap up? Yeah, I would. I, I'd like to say I want everybody out there who's listening, because I know if you disagree with the black nationalism, that you, you're probably frustrated. If you, if you believe in black nationalism, then you're probably frustrated. Let, let me say something about this discussion. I think that these kind of discussions are a thousand times more constructive than just one individual stating their position. i tell you why. And I'm going to go out on the limb and I'm going to say, considering the fact that a couple of weeks ago we did not have a, a definitive term to say what black is, and today I'm going to say I did a great job for a person who's an African nationalist or a black nationalist in defending our position that this is the best strategy for our people to use to achieve freedom. Whether you agree with it or not, I didn't stand there and stumble on this position. I laid out a good case. It's a case that somebody can look at and they can go either way. I also would say that Gus's case, even though I'm going to say, you know, if you're going to ask Irritated Jenny, I'm going to say, we gave the superior answer that the answer is yes. I have to say this. We need to be challenged. 
We need to be challenged every day and every night because we need people to say what Gus is saying. Essentially what he's saying is, don't tell me black nationalism is the answer. If black nationalism is the answer, then use it to resolve the problem. If not, you're just wasting my time. You're talking a bunch of talk. You're not achieving anything. If you're a nationalist, don't be angry at that. That is what should drive us to say he is correct. If black nationalism has power, if it, has, if it is the correct answer, then we should be able to see it getting closer to achieving the results. And at this time, in this moment in time, it is not doing that. So we should want this challenge and not only dispute what he's saying intellectually, but then say, look at the points that he's making that are relevant to us, and if, if, if he's right or wrong, let's create the scenario where tomorrow we can say, see, Gus, there are no more whites. We told you black uh, nationalism was the answer. And for those of you out there that agree with Gus's position, that that is not the answer, then as nationalists, we are in support of you proving to us that we are wrong by creating the solution, the result that we're all looking for, the first stage of this thing, the getting rid of whites. What comes after that, I don't really think it matters that much because until that's resolved, I think we have the kind of friendship and respect for one another that can last until it is gone. And with that said, I want everybody, I want to thank you for listening Thank you for calling in. I don't think I've been in a more constructive discussion in quite some time, and I really am enjoying and appreciating what this forum is becoming. Uh, it's on you to close it out, Brother Gus. Oh, man. Uh, I hope people found it of constructive value. Uh, I'm certain, you know, a lot of other things folks could have been doing with their uh, – their Friday evening. I uh, hope if you're listening to the archives, what have you, that if you invested uh, three hours in uh, listening to the dialogue, you got something that you could use to replace white supremacy with justice immediately. Uh, I, I definitely could be wrong. Uh, I have no problem standing up and announcing to the world uh, if black nationalism proves to be the answer uh, to bring about resolution, I have no problem, A, I did not think that was going to do it. I was wrong. I, was wrong. I have no problem uh, standing up and announcing that to the world. And this was recorded, so you all can play it back. If it does, you can play this back and laugh and have parties. Gus was so stupid. He was wrong. See, you should be thanking us. And I'll autograph and just sit there, and I'll wear the dunce cap. I'll come to the celebration party for black nationalism, have my dunce cap on. I was wrong. I was wrong. Um, I don't think that's going to be the case, but... We shall see. And more important than anything, it's not about belittling another black person. I hope that's one thing. I hope that's one thing. If you don't get anything else, black people do not have to agree about strategies to combat racism, white supremacy. The end goal is not to humiliate another black person, to prove them that they're stupid, they don't know what they're talking about, to show how much you know. The end goal is replace the system of white supremacy for me, but justice, at minimum, total eradication of white supremacy. I think we would agree on that, total eradication of white supremacy. That is the end goal. I, I don't agree with everything Mr. Fuller says. I don't agree with everything Dr. Welsing says. I've never met a non-white person, black person, where I have total agreement on their views on white supremacy, and I don't need that. I'm not looking for consensus. We can exchange ideas. If I can find a black person and we don't agree, if we can have courteous dialogue, that's great. That gives me an opportunity to see where my weaknesses are, to hear different ideas. I think that's fantastic. We need an exchange of ideas. So I hope more than anything else uh, this has been uh, a model for how you can have constructive, courteous dialogue, even if you do not agree with the other perspectives. Uh, hopefully this will – I think all of these programs that we have the second Friday of the month, I think they're all going to be topics where uh, Jeannie and I do not agree. So hopefully you'll get to hear lots of courteous, constructive dialogue with opposing viewpoints that are all centered towards total eradication of white people.